Networking is the practice of connecting two or more computers or devices to enable communication and information sharing. This connection can be established through various means such as wired or wireless connections. It can serve multiple purposes including sharing resources, communicating with other users, accessing the internet and many more. Devices are connected using network protocols such as Ethernet and Wi-Fi and are assigned using IP addresses that allow them to communicate with each other. Networking is an essential component of modern computing and is used in various settings from small businesses to large corporations and from home networks to global networks. Networking is a rapidly growing field with many career opportunities available. As technology advances, the need for skilled networking professionals is increasing. Some of the most popular networking career opportunities include network engineer, network administrator, network security specialist, wireless network engineer, cloud network engineer, and many more. According to Glassdoor, a network engineer's average salary in the United States is around $81,000. In India, it is 5 lakhs per annum. With the help of our Caltech Cybersecurity Bootcamp, you can launch your career as a cybersecurity specialist and acquire the knowledge and expertise businesses need to safeguard sensitive data and vital systems from cyber attacks. With that in mind, hey guys, welcome to the Networking Full Course video by Simply Learn. This video will begin with the basics of networking for beginners, followed by Ethernet. We will learn about types of networks. Next, we will move on to topics like network topology, IP address, OSM model, and TCP IP protocol. Finally, we will cover the topics like network security, firewall, network routing, using Digitra's algorithm, and error detection. Then, we will dive into little advanced topics like stop and wait protocol, sliding window protocol, go back and ARQ protocol, and selective repeat ARQ, and cover dynamic host configuration protocol. We will conclude this networking full course by discussing the essential interview questions and answers of networking to help every individual crack an interview. So let's get started with the two major types of network that should be considered basic knowledge for someone starting out with networking, LANs and WANs. The first variety of networks is a local area network, also known as LAN. It comprises of cables, gateways, switches, routers, and additional parts that allow these devices to connect to private servers, cloud services, and other LANs via larger networks. The growth of virtualization has also sped up the creation of virtual LANs, which let network managers divide and logically organize network nodes without having to make significant modifications to the infrastructure. The computers in each department could be conceptually linked to the same switch in an office with many departments, be it accountancy, IT support, and administration. Still, they might be segregated to operate separately. The benefits of a LAN are similar to those of any collection of connected devices. They may access and even control one another, exchange files, print to shared printers, and utilize a single internet connection. To better understand this logic, let us take a sample structure. We can see the various components of a local network connection in this picture. And now we can see three different devices, a system, a laptop, and a printer. So we have these few devices that need to be connected to a single local area network. Now, to identify these devices inside the network, we need to assign an identifier to each device. So this is where an IP address can help. An IP address is a lengthy string of digits allocated to any device connected to a network that utilizes internet protocol as the communication medium. It's the digital equivalent of your house or workplace's mailing address. The addresses are divided into four sections separated by dots. Each traditional base string numeral portion represents an 8-bit binary integer which can range from 0 to 255. These four integers are expressed in normal decimal notation and then separated by dot. However, computers work with binary numbers, meaning zeros and ones, and each number in an IPv4 address represents an 8-bit binary integer, which is why none of them can be more than 255. The distribution of these IP addresses is not just limited to LAN. Every device which is a part of a network will have its own IP address as assigned by the network administrator. As seen in the picture, we can now identify each device individually by their designated IP addresses. Now, with the primary purpose of a network being the ability of multiple devices to communicate and exchange information with each other, these IP addresses serve only half the purpose, 
since allotment and identification of these addresses need to be managed automatically and on demand. If the laptop shown on the left of the screen wants to use the printer in the network, it needs to know which particular device, or more precisely, which particular IP address to communicate to. This is where a switch comes into play. It takes the role of the delegation of commands in a particular network. Let's learn more about switches in detail. A network switch joins devices in a network, such as computers, printers, wireless access points, and allows them to communicate with each other by exchanging data packets. They can be both physical hardware devices that handle real networks or software-based virtual devices. The vast majority of network equipment in modern data networks are switches. They link desktop PCs, access points, automated equipment, and some IoT devices via wired connections such as card entry systems. They link the computers and data centers that run virtual machines or VMs as well as the actual server and most of the storage equipment. Based on the type of switches employed, they can either differentiate between network devices using either the IP addresses or MAC addresses, which are separate types of addresses allotted to each hardware device irrespective of the network it is connected to. Now that you understand the major parts of a local area network, a major query that may come to your mind is how can these local networks then communicate with other networks? A router is employed at the forefront of every network setup to facilitate communication between foreign networks. This router can then be used to connect to the internet so we can communicate with the loved ones from the comfort of our own homes. So let's learn a little more about routers. The router is a physical or virtualized internet networking equipment that receives, analyzes, and transmits data packets across computer networks. The router checks a data packet's destination IP address and utilizes headers and forwarding tables to determine the best path to transport the packet. Consider the router to be an air traffic controller and data packets to be airplanes flying to various airports or networks in this case. Each package, like each check, has a unique destination and must be steered to its destination as effectively as possible. A router helps direct these data packets to the intended IP addresses in the same manner that the air traffic controller ensures that flights arrive at their destination without getting lost or experiencing severe disruptions. A router employs an internal routing table, which is a collection of pathways to multiple network destinations to properly direct packets. It scans the header of a packet to establish its destination, then consults the routing table to find the most efficient way to their destination. The packet is subsequently sent to the next network along the route. A router also has an IP address which is often called as the network gateway. A crucial part of the networking setup is determining whether a particular piece of hardware is a part of local network or a foreign device. As you already know, specific IP addresses exist for each device in a network, be it a local or wide area network. All these IP addresses must belong to a particular range of addresses which are often known as the subnet or subnetwork and which help determine the overall range of a local area network. For example, the IP addresses that can be seen on the screen right now belong to a subnet that is 255.255.0.0. The first two flags denote fixed values that must be present in every single IP address of every single device in this particular network. In our case, the 192.168 is the consistent factor in every single IP address shown on the screen. This implies that if the devices can connect to a piece of equipment with an IP address and it starts from 192.168, that device will most likely be in the same local area network. The last two places are the free ranges in this example, which means they can be any number less than 255, further helping the router and switch differentiate between multiple IP addresses in a network. With that being said, we can now take a look at how wide area networks work. A wide area network or a WAN is in its most basic form a collection of local area networks or any other networks that interact with one another. A wide area network is essentially a network of networks with the internet serving as the world's biggest one. However, when a router communicates with devices outside a local network, it tends to mask the internally allocated IP addresses and uses a single public IP address for all the devices. This process is called network address translation or NAT IP allocation. A network address translation is the method of translating one IP address to another while these packets are in transit through a router. This improves security 
and reduces the number of IP addresses required by a company. Once the router receives some particular information that must be transmitted to a local device in the network, it checks the internal routing tables to determine the correct internal IP address and the correct destination to send the externally received data to. But let's say a device on the external network or a wider network wants to communicate directly with a device from the local network. This cannot be allowed since this can be a very big security risk for devices in a secure environment. All of this entry and exit rule creation and handling can be taken care of by a firewall. A firewall is a type of network security device that analyzes the incoming and outgoing networking traffic and allows or denies data packets depending on a set of security rules. Its objective is to provide a barrier between your local network and external traffic such as the internet. The most common sort of firewall, which are packet filtering firewalls, check packets and prevent them from getting through if they do not meet an established security rule set. This sort of firewall examines the packet's destination and source IP addresses. If the packet fits an allowed rule on the firewall, they are permitted to access the network. But let's say we, as users, want to allow external requests to reach individual computers or devices on our local network. There are two ways to facilitate this behavior. The first way to go through this step is by using a DMZ, which stands for a demilitarized zone. Instead of communicating directly with the local network device, the external data is sent to the router instead. The router will have created a DMZ subnetwork with only those devices added to it that require the external information to reach them unaltered. Once the data is received by the router, it passes it on to the DMZ subnet and subsequently to all the devices which are a part of that subnet. However, since the external data can reach devices in a network without any firewall checks if they are a part of the DMZ subnet, the security risks associated with this method are very large compared to the second variant, which is port forwarding. Port forwarding is a method of granting external devices access to computers on private networks. It accomplishes this by translating an external IP address and port to an internal IP address and port. All the devices talk to each other and the network gateway using the IP addresses and specific ports. For example, the TCP IP protocol, basic internet usage uses port 80 on every network. Similarly, we can create additional firewall rules to open up certain ports for external devices to communicate with. If the designated ports are open during communication, the firewall will allow the external network device or server to communicate directly with the local network device without any hindrance. That's all we really need to know for now about the basics of networking. Hope you learned something new today. What is Ethernet? Ethernet is a form of communication network that uses a wired medium to connect devices for data exchange in a network. For example, LAN, also known as local area network. Also, WAN, known as wide area network. Ethernet also applies different protocol on the data to be transmitted over the communication channel efficiently and smoothly. Moving on, let's look into why to use Ethernet. As we now know, the Ethernet is a mode of connection for multiple devices to share and exchange data. But using this way of transmission also has its benefit. For example, the Ethernet network provides us with a high speed connection for sharing data. Ethernet also provides the user data with a secure channel for transmission. The data that is transmitted over the Ethernet channel is reliable and has rarely faced any issues at the sender side. Let's move on to the next heading. Now we will look into different types of Ethernet. In general, the Ethernet is divided into three different types. First is the fast Ethernet. This type of Ethernet operates on a twisted pair cable with a data transmission speed of up to 100 Mbps per second. Fast Ethernet connections are used for personal connections or used in companies that require low internet connection. Moving on, we have Gigabit Ethernet. This connection is used for high-speed internet connection with a speed ranging from 
Trouser Name PPS to 1 Gbps. It is an upgraded form of fast Ethernet. And the last type is Switched Ethernet. This Ethernet type installs network devices such as switches or hubs so as to improve the network transmission. The transmission range for switched Ethernet connection is around 1000 Mbps to 10 Gbps. Now let's look into the working of Ethernet. Ethernet services specifically work in the first layer of the OSI model that is known as the physical layer and the second layer of the OSI model also known as data link layer. Functioning of the Ethernet can be divided into three different parts. First step being acquiring the physical address that is MAC address, media access control address of the sender and the receiver device. Then the second step is to check the data security, quality of the data and the connection speed of the transmission channel for efficient and smooth transmission of data over the network. And the last step is to check network traffic and detect any error that occurs in the communication channel. To solve these issues, if occur, CSMA protocols and other protocols are used. For example, the CSMA protocol is used in case of packet collision in the network channel. Now let's look at a simple Ethernet model for further clarification of the steps. But before we begin with the model, the point to be noted is the transmission of data over the Ethernet channel is divided into two parts, frames and packets, where packets represents a unit of data in the network, whereas frame refers to the collection of data packets being transmitted over the channel. And the application of Ethernet services, which includes security, traffic check, and protocols being applied on the data. And that is when it reaches the receiver end. Moving on, let's look into advantages and disadvantages of using Ethernet. For advantages we have, Cost of installing Ethernet connection is low in comparison to other network channels. The security of the data being transmitted over the Ethernet channel is maintained. As for disadvantages we have, it is suitable only for establishing short distance communication network due to high requirement of hardware resources. Whereas Ethernet is also not suitable for sharing real-time data and information. Let's look into some more advantages and disadvantages. Ethernet is suitable for maintaining the data quality of the information being transmitted. It also provides high-speed data transmission option for the network. For disadvantages we have, the network traffic issue is a drawback of installing Ethernet cables. Troubleshooting faults and issues in the internet cable is also a troublesome work. Now let's move on to the last heading for this topic, that is Ethernet versus Internet. The first difference is connection medium. For Ethernet connection, physical cables are required, that means it uses wired medium for connection. Whereas in case of internet, it uses wireless medium such as satellites as a connection medium. Moving on, the next difference is network model. The Ethernet is available only for a low distance connection, for example, LAN. Whereas Internet is available for all the network connection distances, be it LAN, MAN or WAN. Let's move on to the next difference, that is network control. For Ethernet, the complexity of the connection medium is low due to the less distance it uses and also provides much efficient transmission of data over the communication channel. Whereas for Internet, is a large collection of networks and hence require large group of administrator for control. 
the last difference between ethernet and internet is network security and reliability ethernet connection is a secure network from external interference and provides data security whereas in case of internet it is an open type of connection so it is more prone to hacking attempts and less secure network with the first heading that is what is a computer network a computer network refers to a group of networking devices for example computer system switch router or hubs connected to each other through a central unit to share hardware resources and information services the mode to connect different devices in a computer network can be based on wired or wireless medium which depends upon the requirement of the user and the availability of network channels now let's move forward with the next heading that is different types of computer networks available in a network channel there are different types of computer networks available to choose from which also depends upon the need of the user or the network channel on this basis we can differentiate into four different types where the first is personal area network that is pan which as the name suggests is used in personal area to connect devices like mobile phones personal computers etc the next type of network is local area network also known as lan this area network is used to connect multiple devices across different buildings or multiple devices in a single building and the next computer network is metropolitan area network also known as man which connects multiple lan networks within it as for the last network we have wide area network also known as wan which covers locations that are not easily available through wired medium for example different parts of states are connected to each other using wide area network in this session we will look into local area network metropolitan area network and wide area network let's move forward with the first that is local area network the local area network or lan is used to connect devices that are available in a limited range or small geographical location as it does not cover large locations because of hardware limitation the devices that are connected in this computer channel use multiple protocols for proper and efficient exchange of data and internet services the data exchange occurs from a server device that acts as a central unit and is passed on to the devices that are connected in the network channel let's take a look at some of the features of local area network the data transmitted in the network that is lan network is relatively higher in comparison to other network types man and wan because it covers a small geographical distance so the speed of data transmission is very high lan uses private network addresses for network connectivity as the exchange of data and services takes place in a closely lit channel which decreases the error occurring rate and also provides much better security let's take a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of applying lan network for advantages we have it has a single control unit which is used to store data and information and can be used anytime transferring of data and information becomes much easier and much faster in lan networks as for disadvantages we have data security is compromised if the lan admin decides to steal data and information as for the other disadvantages it requires constant administration for continuing data services and distributing hardware resources in a lan network with this we have completed the lan network part let's move on to the next that is man network the metropolitan area network or man is a network type that encompasses network connection of an entire city 
or connection of a small area in a country. The area covered is less in comparison to WAN and faces moderate network traffic due to the large location it covers. The exchange of data occurs from one LAN network to the other LAN network and this case is looped. Let's take a look at some of the features for metropolitan area network. The metropolitan area network covers a large geographical area and is also used as an internet service provider by many of the local services because it provides high data transmission rate. It also applies many network devices for smooth data services and is connected through telephone lines using wired medium to provide high internet services. Let's move on to the advantages and disadvantages of using MAN. It applies fiber optic cable for higher transmission and much better security in comparison to LAN network. It also uses full duplex method for data transmission that is data exchange occurs simultaneously. As for disadvantages we have, it needs a good quality hardware resources and the cost of installation is very high. It also needs an experienced technician to maintain and provide much efficient data services in case of MAN network. Now let's move on to the next heading that is WAN network. The wide area network or WAN is designed to connect devices over large distances like a global network that is the internet because the wide area network covers a very large geographical area for example connection between different states or even between countries it uses wireless medium as a connection mode for example network towers and satellites it also can be termed as the connection of multiple LANs or multiple MANs. Let's take a look at some of the features of wide area network. Wide area network uses satellite medium as we already saw. The satellite medium is used to connect multiple network towers which in turns provide high speed data connection for the devices in a network channel. Whereas the data transmission rate of a wide area network is in comparison to LAN and MAN very low because it uses wireless medium in most of the cases. So the speed of data transmission is low and it also covers a larger distance. So it often faces data errors and loss of information. Now let's take a look at the advantages and disadvantages of applying WAN network. WAN network uses multiple network towers to connect numerous devices to be interconnected with the internet. It also covers a very large area to establish multiple connections between different parts of a country and also connect different countries as well. Let's take a look at the disadvantages of applying WAN network. The chances of an error occurring in a WAN network is very high due to the availability of different types of network channels, network devices and different modes of connection medium. The initial cost of setting up a WAN network is very high as it needs very experienced technician to work on and requires hardware resources example satellites, network tasks which are very costly to set up. Let's begin with the first heading. What is network topology? It is referred to as an arrangement of multiple systems and network devices interconnected to each other through a physical medium or logical channel. The term network topology is combination of two individual network concepts. First is the network part, which represents the devices or systems that are also known as nodes which is connected and how to change the data within the network. Then the other part is topology, which represents the connection medium between different network devices and governs the data flow between them. Moving on, let's talk about why do we apply the concept of network topology. 
For the first point, it allows the users to understand the overall model of the network along with the number of devices installed and their positions in the network, which provide ease of installation of security measures and network and helps in case of troubleshooting cases. Then for the next reason, applying network topology helps the user to understand the communication relationship among the different devices and through a connection medium. This in turn helps the network professionals to set up an optimal network unit for the user. Next in the list, we have different types of topologies used in networking. First is the bus topology, then we have ring topology, then star topology, then tree topology, and in the end, mesh topology. But to understand the concept of topology, let's start by point to point topology. This is simplest form of topology connection which consists of two nodes connected through a connection medium like a network cable. The nodes at the two ends of the cable shares data information between them, where the data sharing part represents the network and the cable connection is the topology part. With this, we have understanding of network topology. Then let's begin with complex types of stuck connections. First is the bus topology. In this topology, the connection channel is a single cable known as the network backbone through which all the other nodes are connected to. In this network setting, the data packets sent by the nodes are provided with the receiver address to avoid transmission errors. The data in this topology can travel from any endpoint where they are termed as terminate points. Advantages of bus topology it is easy to set up due to the simple configuration settings. This setting is also cost effective as it requires only a network cable for the connection. In the case of crash node, the whole network remains unaffected as it does not have any direct connection to the other node. Let's take a look at disadvantages of bus topology. In case of troubleshooting, we require the use of special equipment to detect the fault in the network. In the case of multiple data transmission, the packet collision is the frequent occurrence, damaging the transmitted message data due to the unavailability of network devices such as switches, repeaters, etc. The loss of data over long distances communication is quite high. Then ring topology. As the name suggests, the nodes in the network are connected in a circular pattern similar to a ring. The data transmitted in this connection is always in the clockwise direction. The topology does not have any termination point due to its ring structure. The method of data transmission is used is known as token passing, which involves sending a token along with the data packet to which each of the node matches to identify the destination node using the destination address in the token. Next, advantages of ring topology. The crash node can be easily removed from the network. The configuration settings are not complex for setup and materials are easily accessible. The cost of installation is low as no extra network devices are required to the connection. Moving on, we have disadvantages of ring topology. In the case of a node crash, the whole system is affected and is non accessible due to the direct connection of each node. The transfer of data is slow due to the token passing method in the network. Difficulty in the troubleshooting fault in the connection leads to the crash of the whole network. Now let's talk about star topology. In this topology, the networks are connected to each other through the central hub, which can be a computer or a server. The central units in the connection is also known as the server and the nodes are known as the clients. Any connection between the nodes has to be through the server and is one of the most popular topology connection. Next, advantages of star topology. In case of a node crash, the network as a whole remains unaffected as each node is connected to the server of a connection. The hardware requirements are easily available and of low cost. Troubleshooting is easy through the use of central hub to identify the faulty node. Disadvantages. In case of a server failure, the whole network is shut down 
as all nodes are interconnected through the server. The connection configuration is complex due to the pattern of the topology. Next up, free topology. This topology is a combination of tar and bus topology. The node connection in the topology follows hierarchical pattern with the topmost node as the root and the branching node as the child node. The sharing of data is from the root node to the child node pattern. Next up, advantages of tree. Installation of a new network group is easy due to the root child configuration of the network. In case of a node fault or crash, the whole network is not affected by the error. This makes it easier to troubleshoot the issue. Next up, disadvantages. In case of a server crash in any of the star connection groups, the whole network is affected. Due to the complex setting of the topology, installing security points is difficult in the network. Configuring and troubleshooting internal issues is quite complex due to this topology. Next up, mesh topology. As the name suggests, this topology is a connection of interconnected system connected to each other in no particular order. No installation of network devices such as switch or hubs. This topology pattern can be divided into two forms. First is full mesh topology. In this connection, all the nodes are connected to each other in the network. Then we have partial mesh topology, where all of the nodes are connected to each other available in the network. Let's talk about the advantages of mesh topology. In case of node damage, the whole network does not suffer from the fault. Due to the interconnected patterns of the connection, the transmission of data is very high in the network. Next up, disadvantages. The cost of installation is high due to the requirement of multiple cables and nodes for the network to function efficiently. The management of the network becomes complex due to the large number of interconnections in the network. Due to the absence of repeater or a switch, the data signal loss during the transmission is very high. Now, let's take a look at how to choose best topology for a network configuration. First up, cost. The installation cost is one of the biggest factor that affects the type of topology configuration we choose from our network as the cost of installing cables, routers, switches, and other network connections is low. Then we have easy installation. Installing the hardware devices efficiently and precisely is also one of the factors that affect our choice of network topology. Moving on, we have flexibility, the ability of the topology to include new network nodes after installation and ease of troubleshooting refers to the flexibility of topology. In the hand, we have reliable security. It is important that the topology installed allows us to introduce proper security points in the network and leading the fewer crash cases. By referring the above factors, we can decide the best topology for our network. Assuming that a person had to send a letter to a relative's house, but he wasn't sure which house though. So how can this problem exactly be solved? Well, this problem can be solved if we take a look at the house number mentioned on the mail. Let's take a look at the house number mentioned on the mail. On the mail, it seems like the house number is 2. That means the mail would go to house number 2. Similarly, we also have an identification method on the internet that is known as IP address, which is used to identify different mails and the owner of that email address. Let's now take a look at the agenda for today's video. Firstly, we'll know what is an IP address. Then we'll see what functions does IP address have. Moving on with knowing different versions of IP addresses and lastly, different types of IP address. Firstly, we'll understand what exactly is an IP address. An IP address or internet protocol address, for an example, is a unique numerical identifier assigned to every network device when it connects to the internet. This address is assigned by the internet service provider, which acts as a way for the system to access the internet applications and a unique identity for the device. Moving forward, we'll understand what exactly are IP functions. To begin with, IP functions can be divided into two types. For the first function we have, the internet service provider assigns an IP address to the network device. The first function of the address is to provide an identity to the host on the internet. 
whereas the second identity is used as a location address for the host on the internet. Let's now take a look at different versions of IP address. IP addresses can be divided into two types, where the first type is known as IPv4 address, whereas the other address is known as IPv6. Let's take a look at both of them in detail. For first one, we have IPv4 address. This is the original version of an IP address developed on 32-bit binary format, which contains 2 to the power 32 address. The address range from 0 to 255 in terms of zeros and ones with four octets each of them separated by a period the network device uses binary format whereas the numerical format is used for the host reference the first part denotes the network part in an ip address and the second part is for the host part now let's move on to the ipv6 address type with the rise in technology, the IPv4 could not complete the requirements. So the need for IPv4 arose based on 128-bit address size, which is sufficient for a long time, which is approximately 320 under cillion. This type of IPv6 address is designed for 4 hexadecimal digits and 8 sets, with each block containing 16 bits separated by a colon. Now let's take a look at the IP classes. IP classes are designed for the purpose of easy assignment of addresses to the network. Divided on the basis of class size, we have five classes depending upon the requirement of the network. Class A were designed to accommodate networks with a large number of network hosts, where the first bit in the octet is always zero, with the large number ranging from zero to 127. Then we have class B. Class B fulfill the requirements for medium sized network host where the first two bits for the network ID is 1 and 0 with a range from 128 to 191. Then we have class C which can fulfill the requirement for small size network host where the first three bits for network ID is 1, 1 and 0 ranging from 192 to 223. From this, we get that class A, B and C are used for assigning addresses to the host network. And then we have class D, which is used for multicasting, which means it is used to send a signal from one host to multiple hosts, like used in video streaming, where the first four bits for network ID is 1, 1, 1 and 0, with a range from 124 to 239. And lastly, we have Class E. Network ID for this range is reserved for research purpose and not assigned to any network with a range from 240 to 255. Let's see different types of IP addresses. On the basis of accessibility, we have private IP addresses and public IP addresses. For private IP addresses, the devices are assigned addresses in a network and each system is provided with a unique IP address which they can communicate through within the same network and cannot access public network and they do provide much more security in regards to the public IP addresses. Let's take a look at the public IP address now. For public IP addresses, ISP in or Internet Service Provider assigns it to the router which allows the user to access the internet and also different network application can be accessed. with security less in comparison to private IP addresses. Let's now see the other two types of IP addresses, which are static and dynamic IP addresses. Static IP addresses is assigned manually and is constant to the system, whereas dynamic IP address is assigned by the internet service provider. For static IP addresses, the importance is much more whereas the address is used for business and is not beneficial to have different IP each time. In case of dynamic IP address, the assigned IP for network devices do not need dedicated IP. Due to being constant in nature, static IP address is preferred to be assigned as official address for a business. Whereas in case of dynamic IP address, due to assigning different each time when it connects to the internet, address provides much better security and often prevents hacking. Now if we want to take a look 
at the IP address for a system which is publicly available, we can do by the following steps. Access your internet browser and type IP address. And over here, we can take a look at the public IP address for the system. And if we want to take a look at the system IP address, which is dedicated to the device, you can do the following steps. Access command prompt and write the command IP config. And you can take a look at the system IP address. Let's take a look at the first heading that is IP4 addresses. The first version of an IP address to be developed was based on 32 bit binary format that counts roughly around 2 to the power 32 bits of total IP addresses in IPv4 format, which was sufficient at the initial phase of network requirement, but is somewhat lacking according to the current advancement in the network technology. The addresses in this IP ranges from 0 to 225 in terms of zeros and ones, with four octads where each of them is separated by a period. This is an example for an IPv4 IP address, where the first three parts represent the network ID and the last part represents the host ID. Using the IPv4 address as a reference, we can identify IPv4 addresses from IPv6 addresses. Now let's move on to the next topic that is IP classes. IP classes are designed to allow easy and efficient assignment of IP addresses to a network. Depending on class size, we have five different IP classes in a network that are named as A, B, C and D. For the first part, we have class A that accommodates network with a large number of network hosts, where the first bit in the octet is always zero with number value ranging from 0 to 127. Then we have class B, which can fulfill the requirement for a moderate number of network hosts. The lead bit is 1 and 0, and network ID ranges from 128 to 191. Then we have class C, which can allocate an IP address for low number of network hosts, where the first three bits of the network ID is 1, 1, and 0, ranging from 192 to 223. Through the above three classes, that is class A, B, and C, we can easily identify and assign addresses to a network host. Moving on, we have class D, where it is used for multicasting. That means it is used to send multiple signals at the same time from a single host. For example, used in video streaming, where the lead bit is 1, 1, 1 and 0 with network ID ranges from 224 to 239. And then we have class E where the IP bits for this is reserved for research purpose only where the IP addresses ranges from 240 to 255. Moving on, let's take a look at some of the features for IPv4 version addresses where the first is the memory required for storing IPv4 version addresses in a system is very low. Then we have IPv4 version addresses apply connectionless protocol for sharing data and providing the best effort in delivery. Moving on, we have stacking option for IPv4 addresses. That means in IPv4 version, it allows to create a multiple network over a single host which allows different hosts to connect to it. Moving on, we have IPv4 version addresses being the earliest IP design are applicable to most of the network devices and system for connecting to the internet. So it is supported by many devices. Then we have IPv6 addresses. Let's take a look. With the increase in the need for an IP address, the IPv4 version addresses are somewhat unable to complete the requirements of the network host. So the need for IPv4 version arose, which is based on a 128-bit address size, which is sufficient for a very long time. 
that is approximately 320 under cilion IP addresses in version 6. This type of IPv version is designed of 4 hexadecimal digit and 8 sets with each block containing 16 bits separated by a colon. Moving on, let's take a look at some of the features for IPv6 version addresses. Where the first is, IPv version 6 addresses provides an integrated security protocol for the network that is Internet Protocol Security, IPsec. Then we have, it allows its application to extend in various services according to the need of the network. It also allows address configuration through Stateful that uses DHCP server for network settings and Stateless that applies auto configuration settings. IPv6 addresses also allow some methods to convert IPv4 addresses to IPv6 addresses which is according to the requirement of the host or the network. Moving on, let's take a look at the differences between IPv4 version addresses and IPv6 version addresses. This heading would allow us to choose a best IP address that we can decide for a network. Let's take a look at the first difference that is address and performance. In accordance to the address size, IPv4 version is composed of 32-bit address length and is the fourth version of the internet protocol. For IPv6, we have the address size is 128-bit long and is the latest version of the internet protocol. The second difference is on the basis of address field type. IPv6 addresses are based on numeric data with four fields each separated by a period. Whereas for IPv6 addresses are based on alphanumeric type data with 8 fields each separated by a colon. The next difference is based on address configuration. In IPv4 version addresses, a manual setting for the network is required along with the DHCP configuration settings. Whereas in case of IPv6 version addresses, the network setting is based in accordance to the system's requirement and it also supports auto configuration setting for the system. Moving on, we have the number of addresses in each IP. In case of IPv4, the total number of addresses are nearly 4 billion addresses. Whereas in case of IPv6 version, we have 320 undecillion addresses. Now let's take up a quiz to understand what we did so far. And the question is, identify the correct form of IPv4 version address in the given options. And the options are, you can give your answers in the comment section below. Let's move on to the next difference, that is address security and functioning. IPv4 version addresses do not provide any security function for the network. Whereas in case of IPv6 addresses, integrated internet security protocol that is IPsec is responsible for the security of the network. The next difference is encryption and authentication settings. IPv4 version does not provide any encryption or authentication services for the network. IPv6 addresses do provide mandatory encryption and authentication services for its addresses. Moving on, we have address routing and performance. IPv4 version follows routing protocol that is RIP for network configuration and is preferred over IPv6 version. And in case of IPv6, it does not follow any routing protocols and it uses static routes for network functioning. Now that we are completed with the differences between IPv6 and IPv4, we can easily identify the IP address we want to choose for a network. For today's topic, firstly we'll understand what is an OSI model. Then we'll see the structure for the OSI model. Continuing with 
knowing the layer structure and information in the OSI model. Let's start. To better understand the OSI model, let's take a look at a scenario. Assuming we have two different systems with different operating system installed in them. And there is a communication channel between them over which the data is shared. But sometimes during transmission of data, it faces some problems. These errors often arise due to the different operating system installed in the system or due to a network problem during a transmission. But to overcome such situations, the OSI model structure is used. Using the OSI model structure, we can make the transmission of data over the communication channel error free. Let's take a look at the definition for the OSI model. The OSI model stands for Open System Interconnection Model or a specifically designed set of protocols and standards that governs the modeling and conversion of the data for proper transmission over the network channels. The OSI model is based on the layer structure where it consists of seven different layers where each layer has different set of protocols that are to be applied on the data during the transmission over the network channel. Let's take a look at the different layers of the OSI model. The OSI model consists of seven different layers which perform specific functions and apply different protocols at different layers to maintain the quality and prevent the data from getting corrupted when it is transmitted over the communication channel. Let's take a look at each of them. The first layer is known as the application layer, which is the topmost layer. Then we have the presentation layer, session layer, transport layer, network layer, data link layer, and physical layer, which is the last layer of the OSI model. The upper four layers in the OSI model represents the host layers. That is, they interact with the application related issues when the data is transmitted over the communication channel. Whereas the lower layers are termed as network layers. They specifically deal with the transmission related steps for the data over the network channel. Let's take a look about some information in regards to the layers. Now let's take a look at the function and the data format that is handled by each of the layers during the transmission of data. The first layer is the application layer, which interacts as a gateway for the host data and network applications and handles the data format. Then we have the presentation layer, which handles the initial step towards the conversation of data for transfer. It also handles the data format. Then we have the session layer. Session layer establishes a connection between the network devices for the data transfer. Then we have the transport layer, which oversees the data that is transferred without any error and is in the same pattern needed by the destination system. The data format handled by this layer is segment format. Next, we have the network layer, which determines the part for the data transfer. It handles packet related data. Then we have the data link layer, which performs the task of connecting the physical nodes for the transfer of data. It handles frame data. And in the end, we have the physical layer, which is used to transfer the raw bits, that is in terms of ones and zeros over the physical mode. Now that we are clear about different layers that are present in the OSI model and some information regarding them, let's take a look at each of the layers in detail. We'll start with top to bottom. That is, the application layer will be the layer that we'll be starting with. Let's take a look. The topmost layer in the OSI model is the application layer, which acts as an interface between the user and the applications that are being accessed which can be Internet Explorer, Chrome, or any email client. It also handles different protocols that are needed for the data transmission over the network channel, which can be given as 
hypertext transfer protocol, the HTTP protocol, and the SMTP protocol, which is the simple mail transfer protocols. Now let's move on to the next layer. The next layer is known as the presentation layer. The presentation layer is responsible for performing conversion tasks over the data that is received from the application layer. The conversion of data is done in accordance to the required format. It also performs encryption over the converted data so as to prevent it from getting hacked by cyber criminals or hackers. The compression of the encrypted data is also performed by the presentation layer so that it can be passed on to the session layer. The next layer in the OSI model is known as the session layer. In this layer, the communication channel between two different devices is established. The network devices are individually known as session. The data that is transferred is to be done over these session channels. The layer that is the session layer establishes and terminates these sessions in case of an error or some other unforeseen event. This layer is also responsible for authentication checks regarding the data that is being transferred and also provides data recovery options in case an error occurs over the communication channel. Some model layers. Let's take up a question. The question is, what is the main action that takes place at the presentation layer? And the options are, first option, data segmentation, second option, encryption of data, third option, framing of data, and the fourth option, bit conversion of data. You can provide your answers in the comment section below. Let's move on with the next layer. The next layer in the OSM model is known as the transport layer. The main task performed by this layer is to break the data that is received from the session layer into different segments. These segments comprise of protocols which are UDP protocol and TCP protocol along with the data that is segmented from the received data. Then the segmented data along with the UDP and TCP identification is transferred over to the transmission channel where then it's further transferred to the network devices that requested for the data. This layer also performs a very crucial part which is the flow control. Let's understand flow control over the network channel through a small example. In this example, the server has a capacity to send 50 Mbps of data at once, whereas the receiver side has a capacity for 10 Mbps. When the data is transferred from the server to the client, it transfers 50 Mbps. But it is impossible to transfer all this data at once due to the lower capacity on the client side, which is why the flow control changes is required, which is provided to the server side by the transport layer. Now let's move on to the network layer, which is the third layer from the bottom in the OSI model. This layer is responsible for breaking down the segments into data packets by adding IP address to them that is received from the transport layer. These data packets are then further transmitted over to the best possible route to the destination system, which are governed by the internet protocols, including IP and IPv6 protocols. For example, if we have a data that is to be transferred to the network device 2, we choose the best option that is the route to be transferred over to that network device. Now let's move on to the next layer in the OSI model, which is a data link layer. This layer is responsible for maintaining and terminating the established connection between the devices over the network. The MAC address in this layer is added to the data packets, which are collectively known as data frames. These data frames are then further transmitted over to the physical network. These are divided into two different sublayers medium access control, that is MAC, which controls the established connection device, and the second sublayer is logical link control layer, LLC which identifies the address and provide flow control for the data. 
this data frame as earlier told is transferred over to the physical layer. Now let's take a look at another question to brush up whatever we learned so far. The question is, which layer includes the max sublayer in the OSI model? Option 1, application layer. Option 2, session layer. Option 3, data link layer. Option 4, transport layer. You can give your answers in the comment section below. Let's move on to the last layer in the OSI model, which is a physical layer. This layer is responsible and provides the physical medium over which the data frame is transferred. But the transfer data is converted into bits before it's transferred. The transmission of data is covered by different protocols that are embedded in the physical layer. The transmission of ones and zeros format data is done. It also responsible for maintaining the data quality by applying different necessary protocols and maintaining the bit rate throughout the transfer of data, whether it be wired medium or wireless medium. Now let's get started with the first topic that is what is an OSI model? To better understand the OSI model's role in transmitting data from network to another, let's consider we have two networking devices between which data is being transferred. The path between the devices is called communication channel. Let us assume that we different operating system for the network channel. To overcome such situation, where the data cannot be transferred due to the different OS in the system. OSM model is used, which uses the seven layer structure to allow the conversion of data from the upper model to the data that is to be transferred. Now let's take a look at the technical definition of the OSM model. The OSM model stands for Open System Interconnection Model. A specifically designed set of protocols and standards governing the data's modeling and conversion of proper transmission. The OSI model is divided into seven layers which perform specific functions and apply protocols to maintain data quality without any error. Now let's move on to the main heading for the session that is what is a physical layer. The physical layer which provides and is responsible for physical mode between the sender and the receiver node in the data transmission. This layer converts frames received from the data link layer into bits that is in terms of ones and zeros to be transferred. It is also responsible for maintaining the data quality by applying necessary protocols and maintaining the bit rate through the data transfer using wired and wireless medium. Now let's move on to the attributes of the physical layer. The physical layer has multiple attributes which it applies in the OSM model. The first is signals. The data is to be converted to signals for efficient data transmission, where it has two different types. Digital signals represent the network pulses and digital data from the upper layer, whereas the analog signal is converted data for transmission of the model. The next attribute is known as transmission medium. The network function is damaged without proper conversion at the physical layer. It has two different types. Wide medium. The connection established is made through application of cables, example fiber optic cable and coaxial cable. And the second type is wireless medium. Connection established using the wireless communication network, example Bluetooth and Wi-Fi. The other attributes of the physical layer are data flow, which is defined as the rate of information flow and the transmission wireframe. The factors that affect data flow rate are error rate, receiving incorrect data due to noise in the transmission, encoding, encoding data for transmission over the network channel, and the last is bandwidth, that is the transmission rate of data in the channel. The last attribute of the physical layer is Noise in transmission. During data transmission, the transmitted data may get damaged or corrupted due to multiple reasons, some of which are mentioned as dispersion. In this case, 
data is spread and overlapped during transmission, which causes damage to the original data. Then we have attenuation, which is the gradual weakening of the network signal over the transmission channel. Then we have data delay. The transmitter's data reaches the destination system outside the time specified. Now let's move on to the role of the physical layer in a model. The physical layer due to data transmission ability performs multiple roles, which are the data bit are converted to physical signals and transmitted over the channel by the physical layer. It also integrates multiple electronic circuits for data transmission and apply different technological hardware. It is also responsible for translation of data that is received from the upper layer in the OSI model. Now let's move on to the last setting that is importance of physical layer. The physical layer is responsible for maintaining the communication between the hardware and the network model. Without the physical layer, the conversation of data from upper layer will halt, which leads to collapse of the communication model. It also handles the data flow rate of the data being transmitted along with the time frame of the transmitted data. With this, we have covered all the important points and definitions related to the physical layer in the OSI model. Let's get started with the first heading. What is the OSI model? The OSI model stands for Open System Interconnection Model, a specifically designed set of protocols and standards governing the data's modeling and conversion for proper transmission. The OSI model is divided into seven layers which perform specific functions and apply protocols to maintain data quality without any error. Now, let's move on to the main topic for today's session, which is about what is the physical layer. The data link layer is responsible for maintaining and terminating the established connection between the devices over the network. It has two sub layers. The first one is the medium access control which uses the MAC addresses from the devices to transfer data between them. The second layer is the logical link layer, which identifies, checks flow control and performs the error check for the transmitted data. Advancing, let's take a look at the functions provided by the data link layer. But before we begin, let's understand the data flow between the data link layer and other layers in the OSI model. That is, to begin with, the network layer will share the data packets with the data link layer. The data link layer handles these data packets by integrating them with frame structure where the frame acts as the header for the data packet. The data packet will contain information about the destination address, sender address and other related services. The final product of the data link layer is known as the data frame which is then transmitted to the physical layer of the OSI model. Now, let's take a look at the list of functions provided by the data link layer. First is framing. Framing acts as a header format for the data. Then we have addressing, which handles the physical address of the data frame. Next is flow control, which is responsible for maintaining proper data exchange between the sender and the receiver side. Continuing with access control, which handles the communication link between multiple network devices. The last function is error control. As the name suggests, DDL provides error control services to the data. Now, let's take a closer look at all the data link layer functions. The first one is framing. The data packets received from the network layer are encapsulated in frames by the data link layer for bit-to-bit -bit sharing over the channel. It is also responsible for restructuring the framed data in the network model and each data frame is different from the others. Followed by that, we have addressing. The task of adding a physical address to the frame in the header format is known as addressing. It acts as the identification service for transmitting the frames to multiple network models over the channel. The next one is the flow control. 
during the data transmission the data flow of the sender or the receiver side may be different causing network congestion in the channel the data link layer in such situations acts as a flow control for the sender side to prevent the overflow at the receiver side followed by that we have the access control in this network model when multiple devices share the same communication channel this leads to data collision in the model to prevent such data collisions the data link layer performs checks on the devices with the same network channel to avoid any data loss lastly we have error control during data transmission due to noise or signal loss errors might occur in the data being transmitted to minimize such data error rate the data link layer performs error detection and correction techniques on the transmitted data error detection is done by adding detection bits in the header of the transmitted data and the receiver side can check for any error in the received data now let's take a look at the sub layers of the data link layer in the osi model the data link layer can be divided into two sub layers which are logical link control this is the upper sub layer of the data link layer the second one is the media access control or mac which is the lower sub layer of the data link layer but before we begin with the details regarding the two sub layers let's take up a quick quiz to consolidate what we have learned so far question which of the following task is not performed by the data link layer a addressing b ip services c framing d access control you can give your answers in the comment section below now let's take a look at some points related to each layer of the sub layers the first one which is logical link control this sub layer is responsible for handling and maintaining the communication repeat this sub layer is responsible for handling and maintaining the communication between the other layers of the osi model this layer also performs the task of overseeing the data flow rate of the channel lastly it is also responsible for handling error messages and reliability checks for the data next we have the media access control this sub layer manages framing of the data received from the upper layers this layer also handles the physical media for the model and interacts with the computer and ic it is also responsible for data encapsulation and media access control for the data received now the osi model stands for open system interconnection model a specifically designed set of protocols and standards governing the data's modeling and conversion for proper transmission the osi model is divided into seven layers which perform specific functions and apply protocols to maintain data quality without any error now let's move on to the core topic for this session what is network layer the network layer is responsible for breaking down the segment into data packets and resembling them on receiving end this layer also ensures that the packets are transmitted over the best possible route to the destination system governed by the internet protocols so now moving forward let us look at the network's layer function but before we begin first let's understand the data flow between the network layer and the other layers in the osi model that is to begin with the network layer we will receive data from the transport layer of the osi model the network layer handles these data packets by integrating them with the sources and destination address it also add network protocol for the proper transmission over the network channel now let's look at the functions of the network layer first we have internetworking that handles the network channel as the name suggests then we have network addressing followed by packet routing and packet handling now 
Let's look at the sum of the points regarding the function. First up, inter-networking. It is one of the main tasks of the network layer to handle the network connection between multiple devices in the channel. This task applies multiple protocols available in the network layer of the OSI model for stable network connection. Next up, network addressing. The network layer does the task of adding the source and the destination address in the header of the network channels. The network addressing is performed to identify the device where the data is being shared. Next up, packet routing. Now the establishing and routing path for the data packets is one of the main functions of the network layer in the network model. A network layer chooses the most suitable path out of the line of the path available in the channel. Next up, packet handling. In this, the network function, the layer handles the data received from the upper layers of the OSI model. The network layer converts the received data into the packets for sharing over the communication channels. Now, let's look at the responsibilities of network layer. The network layer is responsible for handling the shortest routing path for a data packet in the network channel. It is also responsible for converting the received data into packets for transmission. This layer also handles the network layer protocol, which is responsible for maintaining the network's traffic in the channel. The OSI model is a specifically designed set of protocols that govern communication channels through which network devices share input and data. This task of sharing information is divided among seven layers of the OSI model for micro-level network communication. Now let's move on to the core topic for this session, that is, what is transport layer? The transport layer is responsible for overseeing the data being transmitted and check there is no error in the data using different network protocols for example, UDP and TCP. Then these data segments are shared over the connection and non-connection network services. It also identifies suitable communication channel for the data. Now let's move on to the next heading, that is the functions of transport layer. Before we begin with the actual functions of the transport layer, Let's take a look at the data flow that occurs between the multiple layers of the SI model and the transport layer. To begin with, the session layer will share data packets over to the transport layer where it will be checked for various errors or corruption in the data received. It is then transmitted into smaller units over to the next layer. In between this, multiple protocols are applied in the transport layer, for example, TCP, UDP, SCTP. And then these data segments are shared over to the bottom layer. Now, let's take a look at the functions available for the transport layer. The first is process to process delivery, multiplexing and deep multiplexing, congestion control, flow control, and lastly, error control. Let's move on with each of them in detail. The first is process to process delivery function. In this function, it is one of the main tasks of the transport layer that is designed to effectively deliver data segments to the correct process among all the working application over the sender side. This task applies a 16-bit port number to identify the sender destination application correctly to transmit data over the network channel. Now let's move on to the next function, that is multiplexing and demultiplexing. The first term is multiplexing. It is also one of the core tasks of transport layer to allow simultaneous use of multiple networks over the sender side. And this is known as multiplexing. Whereas 
demultiplexing is executed at the receiver end to obtain data from multiple senders application. Now let's move on to the next function that is congestion control. This function is used to handle traffic of data in the network model, which arises due to access data being transmitted over the network channel. The congestion control of data is handled in two parts. The first is open loop control, which is applied to stop congestion condition in the network channel. Whereas the second control is known as closed loop control that is applied to eradicate the congestion situation in the network model. Now let's move on to the next function in the transport layer. The next function is known as flow control. The transport layer performs flow management services in the TCP IP network model in a communication channel. This channel applies the sliding window protocol principle to handle the data flow in the network model. To know more about the sliding window protocol principle, you can watch our previous videos. Now let's move on to the last function of the transport layer. The last function of the transport layer is known as error control. The transport layer also checks errors in the information received from the upper layer in the OSM model. Error detection is performed using the checksum method or error detecting codes to check corrupted data. Acknowledgement and no acknowledgement services are used to inform sender if the receiver has received corrupted or damaged data through the network channel. With this, we have cleared all the functions related to the transport layer. Now let's move on to the last setting for the session. That is, what is TLS? TLS stands for Transport Layer Securities. The TLS service is responsible for providing enhanced security to the transport layer in the network model. To ensure that the external services do not affect the data being handled in the transport layer, TLS performs a main role. Let's take a look at some of the TLS services in the transport layer, where the first is known as encryption, which performs encryption procedures for sensitive data being handled in the layer. Next is hidden. Many of the TLS services are invisible to the client side and are only available to the transport layer for being used in data. Compatibility. Most TLS services are available for multiple web browser and are compatible with multiple devices. With this, we have cleared all the points regarding the transport layer in the OSI model. What is an OSI model? The OSI or Open System Interconnection Model is a specifically designed set of protocols that govern communication channels through which network devices share information and data. This task of sharing data is divided among seven layers of the OSI model, which works at micro level in a communication channel. Now let's move on to the core topic for the session, that is, what is session layer? The session layer controls and maintains connection between devices to share data among them. It is also responsible for establishing and terminating sessions in the channel. It also checks the authenticity and provides recovery options for the active sessions in case of a network error. Now let's move on to the next heading that is functions of the session layer. But before we begin, let's take a look at the actual working steps of the session layer in a communication channel. The session layer receives data units from the upper layers in the OSM model or from the communication channel where it integrates the data with session address and the session layer is responsible for maintaining the dialogue between the system that are connected in the communication channel. It applies multiple protocols for secure and safe transmission, for example, RTCP, PPTP, PAP. After that, the session data is being transferred 
to the lower layers in the OSI model. Now let's take a look at the functions of the session layer. Whereas the first is session establishment. Then we have data transfer, dialog managing and synchronization. Let's take a look at each of the functions in detail. The first function is session establishment. It is responsible for establishing connections between systems, also known as sessions. This connection allows user to share data, remote access and find handling in a communication channel. It acts as a transport connection that is accompanied in the session establishment. That is, the transfer connection is mapped when the session is released. Through this connection, there are three ways of transport connection, which are one-to-one, -one, many to one, and one to many. Now let's move on to the next function that is data transfer. One of the core functions of the session layer is to handle exchange of data between systems in half duplex or full duplex network mode. The session layer also allows the user to initiate data transfer in case of half duplex and simultaneous data exchange in case of a full duplex network model. Now let's move on to the next function that is dialog management. The session layer is responsible for keeping log data on which the system establish connection to exchange data. This is known as dialog management. It also uses a token method to maintain the efficiency of the connection by giving the token to the user sharing data in case of a half duplex mode and then transferring it along with the data to the next system. Now let's move on to the next function that is synchronization. The session layer maintains proper interaction between systems and provides a recovery option known as the known state in case of an error. It also uses synchronization points to be added in the communication channel for using a known state in case of an error. With this, we have completed all the main functions of the session layer. Now let's move on to the next heading that is protocols in the session layer. The session layer provides multiple network protocols for security, safety and efficiency between the communication systems. Some of the session layer protocols are Real-Time Transport Control Protocol RTCP. This protocol provides statistical and controls the information for an RTP session in the communication channel. Then we have point-to-point -point tunneling process PPTP. This session layer protocol provides a way to implement virtual private networks also known as VPN using TCP in the network channel. Then we have password authentication protocol PAP. This protocol in the session layer is used as a password authentication protocol by the PPP control to validate users in the communication channel. With this, we have completed all the important points related to the session layer in the OSI model. What is an OSI model? The OSI or Open System Interconnection model is a specifically designed set of protocols that govern communication channels through which network devices share information and data. This task of sharing information is divided among the seven layers of the OSI model, which works at the micro level network communication in a network model. Now let's look into the next setting that is what is presentation layer. The presentation layer performs the task of converting data into an uncomplicated form for the application layer. It is also responsible for encrypting and decrypting data which is shared over the network model. It also executes the task of compressing the data transmission over the network channel for the lower models. Now let's move on to the next heading that is functions of the presentation layer. Before we begin with the functions of the presentation layer, let's take a look at the general functioning of the presentation layer. To begin with, the application layer will share the data with the presentation layer, where the presentation layer in the SI model is responsible for handling the translation and conversion of data based on the network protocols and architecture. 
Some of the protocols applied in the presentation layer are AFP, ICA and LPP. After which this processed data from the presentation layer is transferred over to the session layer. Now let's take a look at the functions of the presentation layer. The first function is data representation. Then we have data compression. And the last is network security. Let's take a look at the first function that is data representation. The data storage and the process is handled by the American Code of Information Interchange and binary coded decimal in the presentation layer. It takes data so that the receiver can understand the data effectively and use it efficiently. It is also responsible for encrypting data for data transmission. Now let's move on to the next function that is data compression. The presentation layer also applies multiple compression techniques to minimize the data required to present the information over the network model. The compressed data is much more easier to transmit and is also transmitted at a much faster speed. Then we have network security. The presentation layer is responsible for adding encryption at the sender and the receiver side so that the data is transmitted with proper encryption over the network model. It also encrypts data sent over the network and provides multiple security protocols for maintaining the encryption state for the network model. Now let's take a quick recap of all the functions of the presentation layer. The presentation layer is responsible for exchanging data among computer devices and applying multiple encoding techniques for safety purposes. It is responsible for dealing with presentation part of the data and integrating multiple data formats for efficient data transmission. The presentation layer is also responsible for formatting translation and delivery of the data shared from the upper layers as well as the lower layers in the OSI model. This layer also manages high level information increasing data transmission efficiency over the network channel. With this we have completed all the functions of the presentation layer. Now let's move on to the next setting that is protocols of the presentation layer. The presentation layer is responsible for maintaining the security of the transmitted data and ensuring that the received data is accurate and effective for the receiver end. This is handled by the multiple protocols available for the presentation layer in the network model. Some of which are Apple Filling Protocol AFP. This protocol handles basic network file control and is specifically designed for Mac based platforms. Then we have Lightweight Presentation Protocol LPP. Lightweight Presentation Protocol provides TCP IP products with ISO presentation services in the network model. Then we have Network Data Representation NDR. This type of presentation protocol is used to implement the presentation layer in the OSM model. And the last protocol is Secure Socket Layer SSL. As the name suggests, this protocol is applied to provide security to the data being transmitted over the network channel by encrypting the data link between the web page and the data service. With this, we have covered all the important points regarding the presentation layer in an OSI model. The OSI or Open System Interconnection model is a specifically designed set of protocols that govern communication channels through which network devices share information and data. This task of sharing and dividing among the seven layers of the OSI model for micro level is known as the OSI functioning. Now let's move on to the main heading for this session that is what is an application layer. The application layer acts as an interface for the user and the application being accessed. It manages the protocols required by the application to present the data to the user. They apply HTTP and SMTP 
and similar protocols for the data transmission over the network channel. Now let's move forward with the next setting that is functions of the application layer. But before we begin, let's take a look at the brief working of the application layer in an OSI model. To begin with, the application layer will share data unit with the lower layers, where the work of application layer is that it acts as an interface between the user and the system applications. It is responsible for applying multiple network functions and protocols to better understand the data and edit them for the lower layers. It applies multiple protocols in the network channel, some of which are Telnet, DNS, DHCP. Now let's move on to the functions of the application layer, where the first function is Network Virtual Terminal. Then we have file transfer access and management, addressing, and mail and directory services. Let's move forward with the first network function. Network Virtual Terminal. The application will allow the user to connect user system to a remote device to access functions and services. To establish remote access for the user, the application layer Stimulates our terminal at the remote host. Let's take a look at the second function file transfer access and management. The application layer through remote accessing can transfer and manage files for the user system in a remote device. The file access of files is handled in terms of file attributes such as file structure and the functions applied to the files, along with the features included in the file system over the network channel. Now let's move forward with the next function of the application layer. That is addressing. The application layer to establish the connection between the network devices requires the need to access addresses. The application layer handles requests from the client to the server device. This is possible by using the server and the client address. The server will reply to the client's address using the DNS service for addressing reasons. Now let's move forward with the next function of the application layer, mail and directory services. The application layer function is also responsible for handling email forwarding and storage. This function of the application layer is also responsible for handling access rights for global information on the network services. With this, we have completed all the important functions applied in the application layer in an OSI model. Now, let's move forward with the next heading, that is, the protocols of the application layer. The application layer provides multiple protocols, providing software with multiple protocols for handling data transmission and accessing the received data over a remote access channel in the network model. Some of the application layers applied in a network model are Telnet. Telnet refers to the telecommunication network. This application layer protocol is responsible for handling access filing over the internet. Telnet protocol uses port number 23 in the network channel. Then we have DNS. DNS stands for Domain Name System. The DNS service protocol is designed to translate the domain name into corresponding IP addresses over the network channel. The DNS protocol uses port number 53 in a network model. Then we have DHCP. DHCP stands for Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol, which is responsible for assigning IP addresses to the host network. The DHCP protocol uses port number 67 and 68 in a network model. The last protocol for the application layer is SMTP. The SMTP protocol stands for Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. As the name suggests, this protocol is designed to handle mail transmission from one user to another user. The SMTP protocol uses port number 25 and 587 over the network model 
for transmission purposes. With this, we have covered all the important points regarding the application layer in an OSM model. Firstly, we'll understand what exactly is the model. The TCP IP model is a method of sharing data and information over the communication channel, where the data has to go through each of the four layer structure of the network model, where it also performs tasks such as remodeling of data, efficient transmission, and error related issues. Each layer has dedicated protocols that they enact on the transmission data. Now let's continue with the protocols that are used in the TCP IP model. To understand the protocols that are used in the TCP IP model, we'll compare it with the OSI model. And if you want to know more about the OSI model, you can visit our video on the Simply Learn channel. Let's begin. The topmost three layers of the OSI model, which are application layer, presentation layer, and session layer, collectively refers to the application layer in the TCP IP model, where they use protocols such as FTP, File Transfer Protocol, HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, Telnet, and SMTP, which is Simple Mail Transfer Protocol. Then we have the transport layer from OSI model, which refers to the transport layer in the TCP IP model, where they apply protocols such as TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, and UDP. User Datagram Protocol. Moving on, we have Network Layer from the OSI model, which refers to the Internet Layer in the TCP IP model, which apply protocols such as IP, Internet Protocol, ICMP, Internet Control Message Protocol, and ARP, Address Resolution Protocol. Then we have Data Link Layer and Physical Layer from the OSI model, which refer to the Network Access Layer in the TCP IP model. These layer doesn't exactly apply any protocol but are connected through physical medium which includes Ethernet, Wi-Fi and cables. Now that we are completed with the protocols regarding TCP IP model, let's take a look at the layers in detail. The TCP IP network model consists of different layers where the original model consists of four different layers which are application layer, transport layer, internet layer and network access layer. Then we have the updated model which consists of layer, application layer, transport layer, internet layer, data link layer and physical layer. Let's take a look at the layers in detail. The first layer that we are going to know about is the application layer. Application layer this layer acts as an interface between the application and programs that require the TCP IP model for communication, including tasks performed by the layer, such as data representation for the software application that are executed by the user and then forwarded to the transport layer. The protocol supplied by this layer are HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, which is used to access information available on the internet. Then we have SMTP, Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, which is used to access email related tasks. Moving forward, we have the transport layer. This layer is responsible for establishing connection between the sender and the receiver device. This layer performs the task of dividing the data from the application layer into packets, where they are used to create sequences, which are then transferred over to the destination device. It also performs the task of maintaining the data that is to be transmitted without error and controls the data flow rate. The protocols that are applied in the transport layer are TCP, Transmission Control Protocol, which is responsible for transmission of segments over the communication channel. Then we have UDP, User Datagram Protocol, which is responsible for identifying error in the data that is to be transmitted over the communication channel. Moving forward, the next layer is the internet layer. This layer is responsible for the transmission of data over the network channel. That is, they provide a proper route for the packets to be transferred over the communication channel. The protocols that are applied by this internet layer are 
IP protocol, which is the internet protocol. This protocol assigns a unique address to a physical system so that it can be identified on the internet. Then we have ARP, address resolution protocol. This protocol is used to find the physical address of the system using the internet protocol address. In the end, we have the network access layer. This layer is a combination of data link layer and physical layer from the OSI model, where it is responsible for maintaining the task of sending and receiving data in raw bits. The raw bits are transferred from the sender side to the receiver side in the format of binary digit, which are zeros and ones. Let's move on with the advantages of using the TCP IP model. The TCP IP model assigns an IP address to each of the system that is available on the network channel so that they can be identified on the internet. Then they are also responsible for enacting different protocols on the data that is to be transmitted over the communication channel. The TCP IP model also enables the user and the system to access different format of data over the communication channel. Now let's take a look at the last topic for this session, which is the OSI model versus the TCP IP model. On comparing both of the network models, we get the OSI model consists of seven different layers, whereas the TCP IP model comprises of four different layers. The OSI model has separate session layer, presentation layer, whereas the TCP IP model comprises of a single application layer. The transport layer in the OSI model provides packet delivery protocols. But in the TCP IP model, transport layer does not provide any such protocols. The OSI model is implemented during network communication. But in case of TCP IP model, it is used as a reference model for the network channel. Network security is a set of technologies that protects the usability and integrity of a company's infrastructure by preventing the entry or proliferation within a network. Its architecture comprises of tools that protect the network itself and the applications that run over it. Effective network security strategies employ multiple lines of defense that are scalable and automated. Each defensive layer here enforces a set of security policies which are determined by the administrator beforehand. This aims at securing the confidentiality and accessibility of the data and the network. The every company or organization that handles a large amount of data has a degree of solutions against many cyber threats. The most basic example of network security is password protection. It has the network the user chooses. So recently, network security has become the central topic of cybersecurity, with many organizations involving applications from people with skills in this area. It is crucial for both personal and professional networks. Most houses with high-speed internet have one or more wireless routers, which can be vulnerable to attacks if they are not adequately secured. Data loss, theft, and sabotage risk may be decreased with the usage of a strong network security system. Your workstations are protected from hazardous spyware thanks to network security. Additionally, it guarantees the security of the data which is being shared over a network. By dividing information into various sections, encrypting these portions and transferring them over separate pathways, network security infrastructure offers multiple levels of protection to thwart man in the middle attacks, preventing situations like eavesdropping, among other harmful attacks. It is becoming increasingly difficult in today's hyper-connected environment as more corporate applications migrate to both public and private clouds. Additionally, modern applications are also frequently virtualized and dispersed across several locations, some outside the physical control of the IT team. Network traffic and infrastructure must be protected in these cases since assaults on businesses are increasing every single day. We now understood the basics of network security, but we need to understand how network security works in the next section in slightly more detail. Network security revolves around two processes authentication and authorization. The first process, which is authentication, is similar to access paths, which ensure that only those who have the right to enter a building. In other words, authentication checks and verifies that it is indeed the user belonging to the network who is trying to access or enter it 
thereby preventing unauthorized intrusions. Next comes authorization. This process decides the level of access provided to the recently authenticated user. For example, network admin needs access to the entire network, whereas those working within it probably need access to only certain areas within the network. Based on the network user's role, the process of determining the level of access or permission level is known as authorization. Today's network architecture is complex and faces a threat environment that is always changing and attackers that are always trying to find and exploit vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities can exist in many areas, including devices, data, applications, users, and locations. For this reason, many network security management tools and applications are in use today that address individual threats. When just a few minutes of downtimes can cause widespread disruption and massive damage to an organization's bottom line and reputation, it is essential that these protection measures are in place beforehand. Now that you know a little about network security and its working, let's cover the different types of network security. The fundamental tenet of network security is the layering of protection for massive networks and stored data that ensure the acceptance of rules and regulations. As a whole, there are three types. The first of which is physical security, the next being technical, and the third being administrative. Let's look into physical security first. This is the most basic level that includes protecting data and network to unauthorized personnel from acquiring control over the confidentiality of the network. These include external peripherals and routers that might be used for cable connections. The same can be achieved by using devices like biometric systems. Physical security is critical, especially for small businesses that do not have many resources to devote to security personnel and the tools as opposed to large firms. When it comes to technical network security, it focuses mostly on safeguarding data either kept in the network or engaged in network transitions. This kind fulfills two functions. One is defense against unauthorized users. The other is a defense against malevolent actions. The last category is administrative. This level of network security protects user behavior, like how the permission has been granted and how the authorization process takes place. This also ensures the level of sophistication the network might need to protect it through all the attacks. This level also suggests necessary amendments that have to be done to the infrastructure. I think that's all the basics that we need to cover on network security, in which our next topic, we're going to go through two mediums of network security, which are the transport layer and the application layer. The transport layer is a way to secure information as it is carried over the internet with users browsing websites, emails, instant messaging, etc. TLS aims to provide a private and secure connection between a web browser and a website server. It does this with a cryptographic handshake between two systems using public key cryptography. The two parties to the connection exchange a secret token and once each machine validates this token, it is used for all communications. The connection employs lighter symmetric cryptography to save bandwidth and processing power. Since the application layer is the closest layer to the end user, it provides hackers with the largest threat surface. Poor app layer security can lead to performance and stability issues, data theft, and in some cases, the network being taken down. Examples of application layer attacks include distributed denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks, HTTP floods, SQL injections, cross-site scripting, etc. Most organizations have an arsenal of application layer security protections to combat these and more, such as web application firewalls, secure web gateway services, etc. Now that we have the theory behind network security has been covered in detail, let us go through some of the tools that can be used to enforce these network security policies. The first tool to be covered in this section is a firewall. A firewall is a type of network security device that keeps track of incoming and outgoing network traffic and it decides which traffic to allow or deny in accordance to a set of security rules. For more than 25 years, firewalls have served as network security's first line of defense. They provide a barrier between trustworthy internal protected and regulated networks from shady external networks like the internet at some point. The next tool which can be used to bolster network security is a virtual private network or VPN for short. It's an encrypted connection between a device and a network via the internet. The encrypted connection aids the secure transmission of sensitive data. 
It makes it impossible for unauthorized parties to eavesdrop on the traffic and enables remote work for the user. The usage of VPN technology is common in both corporate and personal networks. Next, we cover the importance of intrusion prevention systems in network security or IPS frameworks. An intrusion prevention system is a network security tool that continually scans the network for harmful activity and responds to it when it does occur by reporting, blocking, or discarding it. It can be either hardware or software. It's more sophisticated than an intrusion detection system or an IDS framework, which can just warn an administrator and merely identify harmful activities, while in the case of an IPS, it actually takes against that activity. The next tool in this section and the final one are going to be behavioral analytics. Behavioral analytics focus more on the statistics that are being carried over and stored through months and years of usage. When some kind of similar pattern is noted, but the IT administrator can detect some kind of attack, the similar attacks can be stopped and the security can be further enhanced. Another day I've covered all that we need to know about network security, the necessary tools, its different types, etc. Let's go to the benefits of network security as a whole. The first, which is protection against external threats. The objective for cyber assaults can be as varied as the defenders themselves. Although they're typically initiated for financial gain, whether they are industrial spies, hacktivists, or cyber criminals, these bad actors all have one thing in common, which is how quick, clever, and covert the attacks are getting. A strong cybersecurity posture that considers routine software updates may assist firms in identifying and responding to the abuse techniques, tools, and the common entry points. The next benefit is protection against internal threats. The human aspect continues to be the cybersecurity system's weakest link. Insider risk can originate from current or former workers, third-party vendors, or even trusted partners, and they can be unintentional, careless, or downright evil. Aside from that, the rapid expansion of remote work and the personal devices used for business purposes, while even IoT devices in remote locations, can make it easier for these kind of threats to go undetected until it's too late. However, by proactively monitoring networks and managing access, these dangers may be identified and dealt with before they become expensive disasters. The third benefit is increased productivity. It is nearly impossible for employees to function when networks and personal devices are slowed to a crawl by viruses and other cyber attacks during the operation of website and for the company to run. You may significantly minimize violations and the amount of downtime required to fix the breach by implementing various cybersecurity measures, such as enhanced firewalls, virus scanning, and automatic backups. Employee identification of possible email phishing schemes, suspicious links, and other malicious criminal activities can also be aided by education and training. Another benefit is brand trust and reputation. Customer retention is one of the most crucial elements in business development. Customers today place a premium on maintaining brand loyalty through a strong cybersecurity stance, since this is the fastest way to get other businesses back, get referrals, and sell more tickets overall. Additionally, it helps manufacturers get on the vendor list with bigger companies as a part of the supply chain, which is only as strong as its weakest link. This opens possibilities for potential future endeavors and development. That's all really for all for the theoretical part of network security. After covering so many topics, let's go through a small demonstration to drive home this topic's importance. So one of the first things we're going to cover is the installation of NMAP. Uh, what we're using right now is actually VMware, where we are running an instance of a Linux distribution known as Parrot Security Operating System. The Parrot Security OS is a Debian-based Linux distribution that is catered more towards ethical hackers and penetration testers. See, how it is catered more is it comes pre-installed with a lot of tools that ethical hackers need, including NMAP. So let's say you're using another Debian-based Linux distribution. If you want to install NMAP, you can go with the command of sudo apt, which is the package manager, install NMAP, and just press enter. At this point, it's going to ask you for your administrative password because of the sudo command which you have used. Now this apt will change depending on the distribution. Let's say using a distribution that is based on Arch Linux, that will be different. If there is some other distribution which is built from scratch, the commands will differ. But more or less, a lot of the distributions, the mainstream distributions that people use like Ubuntu, Zorin OS, Linux Mint, they are Debian based. So you're just going to be using sudo apt install nmap. 
if you give your administrator password here, it's going to see that Nmap is manual, have to manually installed and it is already the newest version. At this point, if you do not have Nmap in your distribution, it's going to install the necessary package files. If, you, if I just use the Nmap command, you can see some helplines where it basically says what kind of flags you can use, what are some of the most common commands, the version, etc. It gives a small sample for the usage of Nmap. Now, the first one of the most basic functions of Nmap is to identify active hosts on your network. Nmap does this by using a ping scan or sometimes it's called a ping sweep. This identifies all of the IP addresses that are currently online without sending any packets to these hosts. To run the command, we're just going to go ahead and let me just clear the screen for now. Okay. Another thing you have to do before running Nmap just for our ease of use is we're going to use the sudo su command. This will turn our console into an administrator console. So let's say we want to use some drivers or some external adapters or anything that requires administrative permission. We don't have to use the admin password again and again. Just going to give it a bit of time for it to recognize. Great. Now that you see, uh, this dollar sign has changed into a hash symbol, which means we now have root access of this console right now, of this terminal. So what we're going to do for the ping sweep, where we have to check existing hosts, is we're going to use the command nmap minus sp and go with the IP address of the current subnet that you're in, which is always going to be minus one, two, uh, which always going to be 192. 168.1.1 in the 24 bracket. So this is going to take some time considering this is going to check all the hosts in this particular subnet. The command then returns a list of hosts on your network, which is this, and the total number of assigned IP addresses. If you can spot like any IP addresses that you cannot account for in your network or your server, you can then run further commands to investigate them further using Nmap itself. Now coming to another feature of Nmap, which is a very important usage, is when scanning hosts, Nmap commands can use server names, IP addresses, or even IP6 addresses. A basic Nmap command will produce information about the given host. So to run a basic port scan, we can just use the Nmap command with the IP address of the device or the IP address that we are targeting. So for now, the host machine that I am using currently has this current IP address. We can see the current IP address is 192.168.1.22 as it's written in the IPv4 address preferred section. So now we're going to try and attack this host machine using Nmap on Parrot Security Operating System. So we're just going to go with the Nmap 192.168.122 and press enter and it's going to start scanning the host for different services and the IP address that are, that are being run on this system. The speed of these scans usually depend on how quick the processor is and also how quickly the two machines can connect with each other. But the two machines, I mean the virtual machine in this case and the machine that is being attacked, which is right now the host machine, which is running VMware Workstation. As you can see, the post scanning is complete for this particular IP address. And you can see the number of ports is mentioned and the services that these ports are used for is also mentioned. It says which of these are open. For example, the 53 TCP port, we can see it is closed while some of the other ports are open. Now, one more feature of Nmap is the ability to guess the operating system of the IP address that we are attacking. For that, we need to add one more flag which is going to go with the normal command is nmap minus o and the regular IP address that we are in the process of attacking. Let's give it a few minutes to run the scan and it will try and put a small guess on the operating system that this host might be running. This guess might not always be accurate, but it puts a small idea. And this is much more accurate in the case of actually Unix based operating system other than Windows based operating systems. May be able to detect that if it is a Windows or Linux or Macintosh and so on, 
but it may have difficulty finding exact single portions, which will become easier in the case of Linux because we can identify different distributions by some of the kernels, which and the, most of the vulnerabilities comes from the kernels and not the particular distributions. As you can see, the OS detection guess is complete and you can see aggressive OS guesses over here, which is Microsoft Windows XP Service Pack or Windows Server. And there's a 90% guess that is mostly uh, like I mentioned, if you can guess if it is a Windows-based system, you can apply the vulnerabilities and the exploits accordingly. Now, at times, you may need to detect service version and the and similar information from these open ports, actually. This is useful for troubleshooting and scanning for vulnerabilities or locating services that need to be updated, considering a lot of the new updates are used to fix these kind of open vulnerabilities. So the flag that we're going to use in this case is minus SV or hyphen SV. That's the only thing that's going to change with the Nmap and the IP address of the host system staying consistent. A lot of the services that are being run on these ports are often not the most safe. For example, Apache Web Server, which is a very common web server being used for even local and global projects. Uh, a lot of the older versions used to have systems that can allow privilege escalations or other vulnerabilities that can allow hacker to get into your system without even you getting a trace of it. So the updated versions tend to fix these as quickly as possible. And most of these versions do not circulate in the real world, but can be used for ethical hacking and testing on how these on how these vulnerabilities can be attacked further. Now with the SV command scan is complete, you can see that it is mentioning some of the version of the services that are being run on the particular ports. Once again, like I mentioned, using these version numbers, you can identify particular vulnerabilities and use the exploits designed for these vulnerabilities to gain access to the system. Another thing that Nmap does well is port scanning. It's one of the basic utilities actually that Nmap offers and consequently, there are a few ways that this command can be customized further. For example, to come to uh, start a port scan, we're going to use the flag of my hyphen T. We're going to specify a random port, for example, 443, which we know it will be open because it is the port used for HTTPS connections, which is obviously essential for you to access the internet. And once again, we are going to use the IP address of our local host as the test machine that are being attacked. As you can see, it clearly states that the 443 port is open as expected. Now you can use multiple ports. You can check multiple ports this way. For example, and map type in P, we're going to use scan three different ports, 44380 and 445. We're going to use the same IP address again. And it's going to show the state of all the three ports. Now you can see this filtered part here, which, which does not mean it is open and it cannot be exploited in any way, at least right now. Maybe that there is any other service that is being run, it can be exploited further. But right now it is in a filtered condition. That is how we can actually scan for multiple ports together. We can also, uh, we can also use actually in a port scanning in a range format. For example, uh, let's say we're going to scan the ports from 200 to 300. And once again, we're going to use the hyphen P flag. And then the IP address of the system being attacked. It's going to scan all the posts from 200 to 300 and mention what are the posts that are open, filtered, or just straight up closed. As you can see, all the 101 scanned posts are in ignore state. For example, if we try to scan a range in a more reasonable range, for example, uh, 443 to 446, that's it. We keep the IP address similar. And you can see two of them are open and two of them are, are filtered for different reasons. This is how you can find out which of the ports are liable for exploitation before attacking these kind of devices. Imagine our houses without a fence or boundary wall. This would make our property easy accessible to trespassers and robbers and place our homes at great risk, right? Hence, fencing our property helps safeguard it and keeps trespassers at bay. Similarly, 
Imagine our computers and networks without protection. This would increase the probability of hackers infiltrating our networks. To overcome this challenge, just like how boundary walls protect our houses, a virtual wall helps safeguard and secure our devices from intruders, and such a wall is known as a firewall. Firewalls are security devices that filter the incoming and outgoing traffic within a private network. For example, if you were to visit your friend who lives in a gated community, you would first take permission from the security guard. The security guard would check with your friend if you should be allowed entry or not. If all is well, your access is granted. On the other hand, the security guard would not grant permission to a trespasser looking to enter the same premises. Here, the entry access depends solely on your friend, the resident's discretion. The role of the security guard in this case is similar to that of a firewall. The firewall works like a gatekeeper at your computer's entry point, which only welcomes incoming traffic that it has been configured to accept. Firewalls filter the network traffic within your network and analyzes which traffic should be allowed or restricted based on a set of rules in order to spot and prevent cyber attacks. Your computer communicates with the internet in the form of network packets that hold details like the source address, destination address, and information. These network packets enter your computer through ports. A firewall works on a set of rules based on the details of these network packets, like their source address, a destination address, content, and port numbers. Only trusted traffic sources or IP addresses are allowed to enter your network. When you connect your computer to the internet, there is a high chance of hackers infiltrating your network. This is when a firewall comes to your rescue by acting as a barrier between your computer and the internet. The firewall rejects the malicious data packet and thus protects your network from hackers. On the other hand, traffic from trusted websites is allowed access to your network. This way, a firewall carries out quick assessments to detect malware and other suspicious activities thereby protecting your network from being susceptible to a cyber attack. Firewalls can either be hardware or software. Software firewalls are programs installed on each computer. This is also called a host firewall. Meanwhile, hardware firewalls are equipments that are established between the gateway and your network. Linksys routers are a good example of a hardware firewall. Besides this, there are other types of firewalls designed based on their traffic filtering methods, structure, and functionality. The firewall that compares each outgoing and incoming network packet to a set of established rules, such as the allowed IP addresses, IP protocols, port number, and other aspects of the packet, is known as a packet filtering firewall. If the incoming network traffic is not per the predefined rules, that traffic is blocked. A variant of the packet filtering firewall is the stateful inspection firewall. These types of firewalls not only examine each network packet, but also checks whether or not that network packet is part of an established network connection. Such firewalls are also referred to as dynamic packet filtering firewalls. Our next type of firewall is called a proxy firewall. This draws close comparison to how you give proxy attendance for a friend. Like how you take the authority to represent your friend, the proxy firewall pretends to be you and interacts with the internet. They come between you and the internet and thereby prevents direct connections. This protects your device's identity and keeps the network safe from potential attacks. Only if the incoming data packet contents are protected, the proxy firewall transfers it to you. They're also known as application level gateway. A firewall can spot malicious actions and block your computer from receiving data packets from harmful sources. In addition to preventing cyber attacks, Firewalls are also used in educational institutions and offices to restrict users' access to certain websites or applications. It is used to avoid access to unauthorized content. Cybercrimes are today making headlines every day, and individuals and companies must do everything possible to secure their information. Hence, using security devices that help safeguard our networks from falling prey to deadly cyber attacks is the need of the hour. What is IPsec? IPsec, Internet Protocol Security, is defined as a set of framework and protocol to ensure data transmission over a network channel. This protocol was initially defined of two main protocols for data security over a network channel, which were authentication header, which is responsible for data integrity and anti-replay services. And the second protocol is encapsulating security payload 
in short ESP, which includes data encryption and data authentication. Now let's move on to the next setting that is, why do we use IPsec in a network? IPsec is used to secure sensitive data and information such as company data, clinical data, bank data and various sensitive information regarding an institution which are used during data transmission over a network channel. The use of VPNs that are virtual private networks and apply IPsec protocols to encrypt the data for end-to-end -end transmission. Let's continue with why do we use IPsec services. IPsec is also used to encrypt data for application layer in the OSI model and provide security for sharing data over network routers and data authentication. Let's take a look at the working of IPsec services. To begin with, we have two different systems, system 1 and system 2, which will establish a network channel and then the encryption of data will take place when one host will share the data to the second host. During this, IPsec services will secure the data that is to be transferred over the network channel by applying router encryption and authentication. Now let's move on to the next topic that is components of IPsec. The IPsec services comprises of multiple protocols that ensure the data transmission over the network channel. The first one is encapsulating security payload protocol in short ESP. This protocol of IP security provides data encryption and authentication services. And it also authenticates and encrypts the data packet in the transmission channel. Moving on, we have authentication header, in short AH. Similar to ESP, the authentication header also provides all the security services, but it does not encrypt the data. It also protects the IP packet and adds additional headers to the packet header. The modified IP datagram looks this way, where the IP components are included at the second position, the seventh position, and the sixth position, along with the authentication of data services over the network channel. Moving on, we have Internet Key Exchange, IKE. This protocol provides protection for content data and also changes the attribute of the original data to be shared by implementing SHA and MD5 algorithms. They also check the message for authentication and then only is forwarded to the receiver side. For example, this is the original data packet we are used to with IP header path, TCP UDP and data. Whereas this is the modified IPsec data packet where a ESP header is added between IP header and the TCP protocol. Now let's move on to the next heading that is modes of IPsec. There are basically two types of IPsec modes available for data transmission over the network channel, where the first one is tunnel mode. This mode of transmission is used to secure gateway to gateway data. It is applied when the final destination of the data is to be connected to a sender site through a connection gateway over the internet. For example, we have two hosts, host A and host B. Through the Host A, we are sending a message to host B, which will pass through a gateway at host A point. And it passes through a gateway to host B then. This is a basic format for gateway to gateway data transmission. And the given IP datagram format is used for tunnel mode. Now let's move on to the second mode of IPsec that is transport mode. This mode of IPsec is used to protect protocols like TCP or UDP and is used to ensure end-to-end -end communication unlike tunnel mode. The transport mode data at authentication header and encapsulating security payload for security purpose in the IP header. This is the modified IP datagram for transport mode. The point to be noted is the IPsec header is always added between IP header and TCP header. Now let's move on to the last setting for the session on IPsec, that is the working steps involved in IP security. 
In general, there are five steps involved in the working of IPsec to ensure data transmission over a network channel. The first step is host recognition. In the first step, the host system will check if the packet is to be transmitted or not by automatically triggering the security policy for the data, which is implemented by the sender side for proper encryption. Then the second step is known as IKE phase one. In this step, the two host devices, the sender and the receiver side will authenticate each other to establish a secure network channel. It is comprised of two modes. The main mode, this provides much better security with a proper time limit. And the second mode known as aggressive mode, as the name suggests, it establishes the IPsec protocol much faster in comparison to main mode. Let's move on to the third step, which is IKE phase two. After the second step, the host decide the type of cryptography algorithm to apply over the session in the network channel and the secret key for the algorithm to be used to encrypt the data for transmission. Then we have IPsec transmission. This step involves the actual transfer of data over the network channel using the various protocols used in IPsec security, which are implemented under the tunnel condition. And the last step is IPsec termination. After the completion of data exchange or session timeout, the IPsec tunnel is terminated and the security key established is discarded by both the host system. What is network address translation? The motive behind implementing NAT is to allow several network devices to connect to the internet by a single public address. The NAT model is a method to conserve IP addresses by using a unique address to represent the whole private network. And the mentioned public IP address is a globally recognized IP address to access the internet. Let's move on to some more details regarding network address translation. The task of NAT process is to translate a private IP address in a network to a globally recognized public IP address and vice versa. That is, the same process begins from public IP address to a private IP address. This task is performed by a router or a NAT firewall. Let's move on. The flow of this process is something similar, like the router configured acts as an interface between the private network and the public network. That means the private network will communicate with the router when it wants to access an internet. Same is the case for public addresses too. When the public address wants to communicate with the private network, the router will convert it to a private network ID and allow us to access the internet. The reason behind applying NAT process is to conserve public IP addresses. To be more specific, it's IPv4 addresses and it also provides much better security to the network. Now let's move on to the next topic. NAT addresses. There are different types of terms used in NAT process. More specifically, there are some addresses information that are necessary to understand the process which takes place during network translation. We will discuss them one by one. Let's take a look at the first address. Before we begin, let's take a look at the example. This is a general or a simple form of NAT translation process. We have a private network, a private device, a router, a public network that we can access internet through. The first term that is used is known as inside local address. This IP address represents the host of the private network and this cannot access the internet directly unless provided by an ISP server. 
after we have the inside local address through the private network we share it with the router when the router receives this private network id it converts it to the public network that is known as inside global address this ip address represents the whole private network for the outside network and is used to access the internet for the private network now let's move on to the remaining ip addresses for nat according to this example now we are returning from a public network to the private network please keep that in mind according to this the address type next comes up with outside global address this ip address represents the outside network address for the host before nat process took place then we have outside local address this ip address represents the actual address representing the host on the internet after the nat process takes place now let's move on to the next setting and the topic Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Types of NAT. There are different types of NAT available on the internet or in the network channel, but we will discuss three generally used ones. Where the first one is known as static NAT. According to static NAT process, in the given private network, each device will have a particular or a single IP address publicly designed to them. That means if you have two devices in your private network, you'll have two different types of public IP addresses for each of those IP addresses that is available in your private network. Due to this property of the static NAT process, it is also known as one-to-one -one NAT and is mostly used for personal addresses. For example, please take a look at the diagram below. If we have a single IP address in a private network, we will have a single public IP address for the same. Again, if we have another private IP address in the private network, we will have a public IP address for the same. This represents static network. Let's move on to the next one. The next type of NAT process is known as dynamic NAT. For the dynamic NAT process, private network addresses is translated to public addresses from a pool of public IP addresses available to the communication channel. That is something similar to this. According to the example, if we have two private addresses available in the network, then we have two pool of public addresses too, out of which we can convert the private address to a public address. And for example, if we have a third private address and only two possible public addresses pool, then the third address is dropped. Let's take a look at the diagram for a clarification. This is the pool of public addresses available for this network, out of which we converted 192.168.32.10 to 213.5. Point one two three to point hundred. Now let's move on to the last type of NAT available. This NAT is known as port address translation. In port address translation of NAT, the process takes place something similar like this. All the available private IP addresses in the private network are converted to a single available IP address publicly recognized. That means if you have five private networks in your available network, you will have 
a single public IP address available to all of them. Due to this nature of this process, it is also known as NAT overload. But the catch is all the addresses in the private network available will have different port number assigned to differentiate between them. For example, 192.168.32.10 is translated to 213.18.123.100.11 where 101 represents the port number. Similarly, for the second private network we have 192.168.32.12 which translates to 213.18.123.100 that is similar with the earlier case. But the change comes over 0 0.102 that is the port number assigned to the second private address. Now let's take up a small quiz to refresh all the topics that we did so far. And the first question is, what does outside local address refer to in NAT? Your options are name of inside source address before translation, name of destination host before translation, name of inside host after translation, name of outside destination host after translation. Please read the options very carefully to answer this. Now let's move on to the next question. And the question is, PAT address is also termed as, PAT refers to port address translation. Option A, static net. Option B, one to one NAT. Option C, NAT overload. And option D, NAT overlapping. You can give your answers in the comment section. Now let's move on to the last heading for this session. That is, advantages and disadvantages of applying NAT in a network channel. Let's take a look at the first advantage of using NAT. NAT provides privacy and security measures to the private address as it converts the private address to a public address through which we can prevent our ID from being hacked over the internet. Let's move on to the next advantage. NAT process is applied to conserve approved IP addresses over the network channel. As discussed earlier in the previous slides, NAT process helps to conserve us IPv4 addresses. Now let's look into some disadvantages of applying NAT in the network channel. And the first disadvantage is NAT translation leads to part delay and prevent some applications to lose their access over the network channel. Now let's take a look at the second disadvantage. According to the NAT process, router is the one that translates a private address to a public address or vice versa. During this process, it does happen to tamper with the port numbers as we already discussed. But according to the rules set by the network channel, router is not usually allowed to hamper with the port numbers, but it has to because of NAT. Let's begin with the introduction to the network hub. A network hub is a device that is designed to connect multiple network units in a closely connected network channel. So hubs are also used in LAN networks. The network hub shares data with the destination device by acting as a central connection point of data transmission and connecting all the other devices to, in the channel. Some points to remember about the working of a hub. Hub is incapable of processing any complex protocols due to the absence of an intelligent unit in the system. Also, the physical model of the hub is composed of multiple sockets for connecting network devices. Now let's move on to the working of a network hub. For the first scenario, we will assume that a message is being sent through the hub to a destination node. Let's begin. According to the example, hub has received a message for device A. 
where it will share the same message to device A, which is a basic protocol. But due to the absence of any intelligent unit or a processing point in the hub device, it will share the message for A to all the other connected devices that are device B as well as device C. This creates a lot of access of traffic in the network channel. Now let's move on to the second scenario, which is when receiving a response from the device. In this case, when the device A shares a response to the hub to be sent to the sender device, it will share the same response to all the other connected devices, again, due to the same reason, that is lack of any processing unit or intelligent point in the network channel. Please take a look at the arrow points, which is very important during the transmission of data. With this, we have clear all the points that are important for a network hub. Now let's move on to the next topic that is information on switches. The network switch is a networking device that is active in the data link layer of the OSI model and is designed specifically to connect private networks in a LAN channel. Switches are programmed to share messages only with a designated device that is mentioned in the header format of the message, which cuts down the network traffic in the channel. Switches uses different types of data, which can be either packets or data frames. Switch uses a destination source address, and the destination address for forwarding the message to the specific device in the system. Now let's look into the working of a network switch. The first scenario is when the message is received to a switch and is to be forwarded to a particular device. In this case, we are receiving a message for device A, which will be shared only to device A according to the address mentioned in the header format. This decreases the network traffic in the channel and also prevent the access of message to device B and device C. This task of managing the address and sending the data to the designated device is handled using MAC address, which is used by the network card installed in the network device. Now let's move on to the second scenario that is receiving a response from the device. In this case, the switch will receive a response from device A, which will be forwarded to the sender's address mentioned in the message. And this will prevent the response to be shared to device B and device C due to the presence of a processing unit in the switch. With this, we have completed all the important points to be known regarding a network switch. Now let's move on to the third topic that is information on routers. Let's begin. A network router is a device that is designed to share data between multiple networks at a much larger scale in comparison to a hub or a network switch. It is connected to multiple devices at a very large level that can be considered as metropolitan area network or a wide area network. Router uses IP addresses to share data with the specified device in the network channel. And they also perform the task of translating an address that is available in a private network to a globally recognized network so that it can access internet, which is known as NAT. Network Address Translation. If you want to look further in the translation process that the router performs, you can visit our video on the same in the Simply Learn channel. Now, with this, we have completed all the introduction points regarding a network router. Now, let's move on to the working of a network router. In this scenario, a message has been received by the router for device A, from which it will deduce the IP address for the device A and share the data. The message deliver efficiency is highest in case of a network router 
as it uses routing path from a routing table to guide the message to its destination point and vice versa. With this, we have completed all the important points regarding a network router. Now let's move on to the last setting for this session that is difference between a network hub, switch and a router. For this difference, we will use different features to differentiate the working of a hub, switch and a router. The first difference is based upon the OSI model layer. In case of a hub, it is active in the physical layer of the OSI model that is also known as the first layer. And in case of a switch, it is active in the data link layer of the OSI model also known as the second layer. Whereas a network router is active in the network layer of the OSI model also known as the third layer. Now let's move on to the next difference that is based on addresses used by each of them. Let's take a look. A hub, as we already discussed, doesn't use a MAC address or an IP address for the transmission of data in the network channel. In case of a switch, it uses MAC addresses available in the network channel to provide a guidance system for the message to be transferred. Whereas in case of a router, it uses IP addresses to transmit the data to the designated device. Let's move on to some other differences. That is format of data used in each of them. Hub uses electrical signals or bits for data transmission in a network channel. Whereas switch uses a data frame or data packets for the transmission of data over the communication channel. And in case of a router, it uses data packets to be transferred. And the next difference is based on the mode of transmission. Let's take a look for this. A hub is based on half duplex network connection. That means at a certain point of time, only a single device can share or receive data from the other endpoint of the network channel. And in case of a switch, it is full duplex network connection. That means it can simultaneously receive and send a data packet or a data frame to any of the network devices connected in the system. Similarly, a router is also based upon the full duplex network connection form. Let's move on to the next difference. That is installation purpose. On the basis of installation purpose, a hub is mainly preferred in a LAN network or in a private network where two to three devices are to be connected, which increases the efficiency due to the absence of a processing unit in a hub. As for a switch, it connects multiple LAN networks or a large area network available. As for the case in a network router, it is a global network that connects multiple devices across the globe and is also designed to connect internet to any of the device. Let's take a look at the next difference. That is device classification. In case of a hub, it uses broadcast format or a broadcasting device to transmit data over the communication channel due to the absence of any processing unit in the system. And in case of a switch, it uses multicasting application for the transmission of data and in case of a router, it uses routing path from a routing table to transmit the data in the communication channel. Let's take a look at a few more differences. That is installation cost. A network hub can be installed very easily in a network channel as it does not perform any complex task. In case of a switch, it required moderate cost installation as it performs some complex queries or complex protocols in the network channel. Whereas in case of a router, it is the most expensive to install in the network channel due to the high device picks and the performance based protocol. 
and the next difference is based upon processing and intelligence. Now that we are clear, a hub device does not have any processing unit or intelligence point and is the most basic point of data transmission. Whereas in case of a switch, it possesses a processing unit to differentiate the destination address or a source address in the header format of the message. Whereas in case of a network router, it is the most sophisticated device among all the three network devices as it performs the most complex queries and protocols in the network channel. What are switching techniques? Switching techniques are network techniques responsible for overseeing the transmission of data over different communication channels. They are also responsible for choosing the best route for data transfer. Next, we will look into why to apply these switching techniques. Using the switching techniques, we can choose the best and the most efficient route for data transfer in the network. For example, if we want to send some data from node A to node B, we can do so by moving from node A to a switch, then node D, then to node B. But doesn't this seem like too long? This is where the switching techniques plays its role. Using the switching technique, we can choose the smallest and the most efficient way, that is node A, switch, then to the node B. Next, we will look into different types of switching techniques. Switching techniques can be divided into three primary types. The first is circuit switching that requires a predestined path for data transmission. Then we have message switching, which integrates the destination address with the data for transmission. And in the end, we have packet switching that divides its message into smaller units known as packets. Packet switching can further be divided into two different types that are virtual switching and datagram switching. Now let's look into some details regarding each of the types. On the first note we have circuit switching. In circuit switching, for data transmission to occur, a pre-established path is required between the sender and the receiver node. For example, assume that we call someone. Then this request is sent over to the network switches. And a route is to be established for the signal to pass through. After the system assigns a route for the signal to pass through, then the receiver receives the call from the caller side. This is how it works. Now let's look into some points to remember about circuit switching. For circuit switching, we require a dedicated channel established between the source and the destination node for the network to pass through. The data transmission can take place only after the path is established. And the last point to remember is, other than the sender and the destination node, no node can interfere with the transmission of data to the established route. Let's look at some advantages and disadvantages of applying circuit switching in a network. For first one, we have advantages. Data transmission in circuit switching is sure to be established due to the predestined path. Circuit switching is preferred for long and continuous transmission of data due to the pre-established path route. Then let's look into some disadvantages. The time required to establish the connection is quite long due to the time required to establish a path. Also, due to the continuous transmission of data in circuit switching, more bandwidth is required for maintaining the connection. Let's move on with message switching. In message switching, no predestined path is established between the sender and the destination node in the message. This technique integrates the destination address into the data transmitted and is shared over the network. Let's look into the setup to better understand the working of message switching. For first step, 
the sender node integrates the destination address into the message. Then the whole message is transmitted to the switching node in the network where it gets stored for the next transmission. And similarly, like the second step, this transmission of data is done over the whole network. And finally, through the destination address in the data, it reaches the receiver node. This is how the message switching works. Let's take a look at some points to remember about message switching. In message switching, no predestined path is established. It uses dynamic routing as the message is transmitted through the communication channel in real time. The each node in network switching stores the data unless it is transferred over to the next switch node. Let's take a look at some advantages and disadvantages of applying method switching. To begin with, let's take a look at the advantages. The size of the data that can be transmitted over message switching is variable. In message switching, the use of bandwidth is done in an efficient manner. Now let's look into some disadvantages. For message switching, the nodes that are known as the switch node is to be provided with sufficient storage memory. There is a delay in reaching the destination due to the message technique. That is, the message has to stop at each of the switch node before it is transferred over to the destination node. Now let's look into the last switching technique that is packet switching. In packet switching, the message is broken into smaller data units known as packets. These packets are appended with relevant network details for the transmission over the network. Let's look into the working of packet switching. We know that in packet switching, the data is broken into smaller units packets, which each packet is given a sequence number for identification. These packets are integrated with the required sender and receiver address and switching method to choose the smallest route to reach the destination node. These packets are then recombined at the destination node in the correct sequence order. Now let's look into some points to remember for packet switching. For packet switching, all the data packets that are provided with unique number for identification at the receiver end, that is 1, 2, 3 and 4 in the previous example we just used. Packet switching chooses the most shortest path possible for the data to reach the destination end. In case we have unreached packet or some unattained packet, the whole message from the sender side is sent again to the receiver end. Now let's look into some details regarding advantages and disadvantages of applying packet switching. Advantages of using packet switching is it provides rerouting in case the network node is busy. It also allows multiple user to access the same network and no predestined path is needed. The disadvantage of applying packet switching is the protocols that are needed for the working of packet switching is very complex. There are often cases of loss of data packets during the transmission in case of overloading or corruption of data. The CIDR or classless interdomain routing is a network concept designed to oversee the assignment of IP addresses to a system to replace the outdated way of classful addressing system. Furthermore, using the CIDR method, there is low wastage of IP addresses and it also is helpful in maintaining the routing table and it performs the task of subnetting, which saves a lot of IP addresses. Now let's move on to the next heading that is 
Rules of using CIDR To better understand the working of CIDR addressing in the later part, please take a look at the rules very seriously. Let's take a look at the first rule, that is, the IP addresses assigned are according to the CIDR are to be continuous, as the ISP will provide them in a sequence to minimize the address wastage. For example, if we have an IP address 200.10.18.32, then the addressing will take place as 200.10.18.33 and moving on to the nth position as mentioned in the example. This proves that they are continuous in assigning of IP addresses. Let's move on to the next rule that is, the number of addresses in a CIDR block is to be power of 2 that is in case the number of addresses is odd then it's invalid value for example 2 to the power 4 is equal to 16 where 4 represents the number of host whereas if the value is 17 then it's an invalid value as for the last rule we have use of CIDR block for notation purpose that is for example if we have 200.11.19.34 slash 28 as an IP address, then the block ID of this IP address is 28 and the host ID is 4, which is calculated using 32 minus 28 because in an IP4 address, 32 bit is the maximum limit. Now let's move on to the next setting that is working of CIDR. The CIDR addressing applies the variable length subnetting masking, that is VSLM for short, as the basis of its working method. That is used to break the conventional IP addresses into smaller subnetworks of varying sizes according to the user requirement. Let's take a look at an example to understand the working process. In the given example, the IP addresses 195.10.20.40/ 16. Now let's solve the question. To begin with, from the given IP address, we can determine the network prefix that would be 195.10.20.40, whereas the suffix represents the slash 16 part. The number 16 in an IP address represents the number of ones in the address that is known as the block ID or the network ID. And the host ID is determined using 32 minus 16 because 32 is the maximum limit of bit length in an IPv4 address. So the host ID is 16. And the total number of hosts that are available in the network is calculated using 2 to the power number of hosts. That would be 2 to the power 16 for this case. So the value is 65,536 available hosts in this given network ID. Now let's move on to the examples to better understand the working. The first example is the given IP address 192.168.200.10 slash 28 and we have to find the relevant information. Let's begin. For the first step, convert the IP address in a binary decimal format. That is, for this IP address it would be the given binary format. Now let's find out the network mask for this IP address that would be 28 ones and four zeros. The point to be noted is according to the slash number we point the number of ones for network mask. For example in this question we have slash 28 so the network mask has 28 ones beginning from left to right and the last four digit would be 0 and in numerical form the value comes out to be 255.255.255.240 and this is the network mask for our IP address. Now let's move on to the next information that is network ID. The network ID for the given IP address is calculated using this way. By the given subnet mask that is slash 28 we assume that 192.168.200 does not change because 
it is a part of network id and the point to be noted is the network id is never to be tampered with only the host id can be used to change the value that means we will open the dot 10 part in binary format that would come out to be 0001010 then change ones to zeros and perform the and operation after performing the and operation for the last four digits that is the host id part we will get 192.168.200.0 slash 28 that represents the network id for the given ip address similarly we can find the number of host that would be easy that is 32 minus 28 that is 4 and the total number of hosts would be 2 to the power 4 that is 16 and the first host id in this given ip address would be 192.168.200.1 with the completion of this example we have completed all the relevant parts regarding cidr working introduction to the algorithm The Dijkstra's algorithm was invented by Edgar W. Dijkstra. This algorithm was designed to find the shortest path between the nodes of a communication channel. The Dijkstra's algorithm is also used to form a shortest path table for the given graph and it works on the principle of greedy algorithm. Now let's move on to some key points regarding the algorithm. The first key point to be noted to solve a Dijkstra's algorithm is the algorithm is closely linked to position of the nodes in a graph. The next point is the attribute value between the nodes of a channel is used to deduce the shortest path. As for the last point we have the initial value of all the nodes from the current node is assumed to be infinite. To much practically understand the functioning of the Dijkstra's algorithm, let's take a look at the principle for the same. The principle of the algorithm works as if the distance of u that represents the current node plus the length that is the attribute value between node u that is a current node and node v that is the target node is less than the attribute value to distance of the target node and also the distance of the target node is equal to the distance of current node plus the length between target node and the current node where distance u represents the source node or the current node and distance v represents the target node or the destination node to much better understand Let's apply this. For the given question, let's find the shortest path. In this given example, we have three different nodes, node A, B and C. Using the previously discussed algorithm principle, we will deduce the shortest path for node A to the other nodes in the graph. That is, the shortest path from node A to node B and the shortest path from node A to node C. For this, let's take the node B first. According to the solution, it should be for node B on applying the algorithm along with the values, we have if 0, that is the position of A is 0, plus the target node attribute value, that is 10, is less than equal to infinite, that is, Initially, as mentioned, infinite value is to be assumed. And this statement stands true. So the distance between node A to node B becomes 10. For the third step, we will look into distance between node A to node C. That would be 0 plus 40. That is the direct connection between node A to node C according to the example, which is less than infinity, again true. So, the distance between node A to node C is 40. 
moving on but we have to find the shortest path so for this fourth step comes into picture that is for node c from node b on applying the algorithm we have 10 that is the initial value of node b and plus 15 that is the attribute value between b and node c which is 25 and is less than infinity so the shortest path between node a to node c becomes 25 instead of 40 which was given through step 3 using the same scenario and same steps we will solve a much difficult question and understand how the algorithm is used then without further ado let's move on to the solved example using the Dijkstra's algorithm according to the given question we have to use the Dijkstra's algorithm for the given graph and find the shortest path from node A to node C. The point to be noted is we need to find distance that is shortest between node A to node C only. Now let's take a look at the graph and this is the given graph with node A at the current node and node C is to be the targeted node. But before we begin with the solution for the given graph, let's take a look at some of the important points to remember. The first point, the distance of node A from all the other nodes is infinite in the starting step as discussed earlier in the example graph. The next point is, the node with the shortest value will become the next current node. Then we have, this graph is done to maintain a proper shortest path value table which will be very helpful during the solution of the graph. Now let's move on to the solution. To begin with we will make shortest path table value that is given through this with three columns in it node column value column and previous node. Now let's start with the actual solution. To begin with, the first step is to mark the current node, that is, node A. Then, the nodes that are directly connected to the current node, that is, node B and node D. Now, using the value distance, that is, 3 for node A to node B and 8 for node A to node D, we will update our table. Where the point to be noted is, that we have updated the previous node as A for both the nodes B and D. Moving on, now let's choose the next current node that is node B for the next case because the shortest path in the given table is 3 which is less than 8. Now, the directly connected nodes to node B are node D and node E. Similar to the case we did earlier, we will mark the shortest distance from node B to node D and node D. E. Let's deduce the distance. The distance between node B to node D is 3 plus 5, that is equal to 8. And then we have distance from node B to node D, that is 3 plus 6. So the value is 9. Now we will update our shortest path table and the new table comes up to be from node D to node B we have 8 and node B to node E we have 9 with the previous node as B. Moving on let's decide the next current node that is D because the shortest distance is 8 in comparison to 9 for node E. So the new current node is node D and the directly connected nodes to node D is node E and node F. The point to be noted is the current node is chosen only from the unvisited nodes. Now 
For this we have distance between node D to node E is 8 that is the previous value we did use plus 3 that is the distance between node D to node E and the total value comes up to be 11. Then we have to node F from node D that is 8 plus 2 that is the distance between node D and node F. So the value becomes 10. On updating the shortest path graph table we have the new distances that is node F has 10 value with the previous node as D and there is no change with the node D because in comparison to 8, 11 is much bigger. Moving on, let's choose the next current node that is node E because in comparison the value 10 from node F, 9 is smaller. Now the node E is a current node and the directly connected nodes are node F and node C. Now let's find the value between node C and node E. That will be 9 plus 9 that is the distance between node E and node C. So the value totals come up to be 18. And for node F and node E we have 9 plus 1 that is the distance between node E and node F. That comes up to be 10. Now let's compare with the graph table where node F is originally at value 10 and again the value is 10 so there is no change. And C we have infinite and the value 18 is much smaller. So the new graph would be something like this with node C as 18 value and previous node as E. Now let's decide the next current node that is node F because the distance value is lowest in the given graph that is 10 and for node C is 18 and the directly connected node is node C then the distance comes up to be 10 plus 3 that is 13. Using this 13th value we can decide the current value of C is 18 and the new value is 13. In comparison 13 is obviously less. So the new graphs comes out to be for node C value 13 and the previous node becomes F. With the completion of all the nodes in the given graph, we can deduce the shortest path from node A to node C. That comes up to be from node A to node D, node D to node F and node F to node C. And the total value comes up to be 13. With this, we have covered all the parts regarding the functioning and the working steps involved in the Dijkstra's algorithm. If you have any questions regarding the topic, you can ask them in the comment section. Introduction to Distance Vector Routing Distance vector routing refers to the distance or the vector that is between the neighboring nodes in a network channel. And the routing part refers to the established route through which data packets are transmitted in the network channel. The other aspect of this routing protocol in a network channel is to determine the shortest path for a data packet in the network to reach its destination. Next we will look into some key points regarding the routing protocol. For routing protocol, three primary key points are to be remembered. First one being, each router in this protocol is designed to share the vector data of each node throughout the network. This step is done to maintain proper circulation of data in the network channel. The next key point is the routing pattern in the network protocol. That is, the data shared by the routers is transmitted only to those nodes that are directly linked to a particular router. The last key point is that the routing protocol is designed in a manner that it shares the updated vector data periodically at the network channel. Now let's move on to the next heading that is 
the algorithm used in the protocol. The algorithm used in this protocol is termed as Bellman fold algorithm. This algorithm defines the shortest path that a data packet can take to reach its destination node from an initial node, where d of x, y refers to the least distance from a node x to node y. Moving on, we have c of x, v, where x is cost from each of its neighboring v node is taken into consideration. Then we have d of v, y. This is the distance of each neighbor from its initial node. And lastly, min of v. This is an abbreviation we use to determine the most shortest vector after the solution is obtained using the algorithm. In the next heading, that is network example, we will understand all the points used in the algorithm. Now let's design a network model with five different nodes that are A, B, C, and D, with each node connected to each other using different network channel. The numerical values in the network channel refers to the vector count that is the distance from node A to node B or to some other node in the network channel. In a network model, each node share its vector data with its neighboring node at a regular interval as there are various updates in the network model. This data is shared in a form of routing table where three different columns are used. First being destination column, second vector column that is the distance node and lastly the hop. Let's take a look at the neighboring nodes for this model. For node A, we have B and E as it is directly interlinked to the node A. For node B, we have node A and node C. For node C, we have B and D. For D, we have C and E. And lastly, for E, we have node A and node D. These nodes represent only the neighboring nodes. Now let's solve an actual example on routing protocol to clear all our doubts and understand the key points. The example we will be taking to solve is this network model. The initial step to start solving the network model using the distance vector routing protocol is to make routing table for each of the nodes. Let's make the routing table for node A. This is the routing table for node A, where we have destination as A. That means destination is A from node A. That means the distance vector should be zero. Then we have destination as B. Let's take a look. In this given example, there is no given connection between A and B. That means this distance vector would be infinity. Then we have destination as C. Similarly as node B, there is no direct connection between A and node C. That means this is also infinity. And same is the case with node D. And in the end we have node E that is the only directly linked node to node A. That means the distance given is 5. So the network vector is 5. Let's make an another routing table for node E. This is the routing table for node E. Let's take a look. In this routing table the first is destination to node A. According to the network model given, distance is 5. So the vector value is 5 with the hop to A. 
then we have destination as node b according to the model the distance vector should be 4 then we have destination as node c as given there is no direct connection between node e and node c that determines the value would be infinity then we have node d which represents direct connection with node e and the value is 7 and lastly e destination from initial point e would be 0 vector now let's make another routing table similarly for node c now using the same steps you can make the routing table for the remaining nodes that is node b and node d now let's move on to the next step in solving the routing issue this step is known as update step in this step we use the vector column from each of the node to update the vector column or the routing table for a particular node in this part we'll use node e's vector column to update the routing table for node a and the steps are using the algorithm that is the bellman fold algorithm we used earlier as we already know moving from a to destination node a is always zero so we won't be doing this step let's move on to the next one that is moving from node a to node b that would be would be a comma e as we are using vector column of node e plus and the distance used to reach e from b a comma e represents 5 and e to b represents 4 according to the network model so the value is 9 similarly let's solve for a to c to a to c we have a comma e plus destination required to move from e to c according to the network model we have node a is only directly linked with node e so the value would be 5 but there is no connection between node e and node c so the value would be infinity moving on we have a to d in this case we have a comma e the value would be 5 plus e to d that is a direct connection and the value would be 7 so the total distance is 12 and the last one is a to e for this we have a comma e that is directly the neighboring node the value would be 5 so the new routing table for node a is 0 9 infinity 12 and 5 similarly let's take another node for this for the next node we will take node c and we will update the routing table of node c using its neighboring nodes that are node b and node d according to the network model now how to do this step firstly it's c to destination a in case of node b we have c to a that would be c comma b that is a direct connection plus distance required from b to a according to the network model we have c comma b as 6 plus b to a does not have any connection that is infinity so the value would be null then we have node d in this case we have c comma d that is a direct connection 3 plus d to a that is again infinity as it is not linked directly to node a moving on we have destination as b for node b we have direct connection so c comma b value is 6 whereas for node d we have c comma d that is distance 3 plus d to b that is infinity as it is not directly linked with the node b so again the value is null then we have 
destination as C. So connection between C to C is 0. Moving on we have destination at node D. That would be C to D as C to D as there is no direct connection between node B and node D. So the value is infinity. Whereas for C to D is a direct connection for node D. So the value would be 3. Now for the last node that is node E. In case of node B we have C comma B plus B to E. Where the value for C to B node is 6 and B to E is 4. So the sum is 10. And now in case of node D we have 3 plus 7. That would be distance from C to D and then D to E. And the value would be again 10. So we can use any of the side to reach the destination node E. By completing all the steps we have the new table for node C. Similarly we can find the routing table for all the nodes present. Now to look into some key points we learned. For the initial step use only the node distance of immediate neighbors. Nodes without distance that is directly linked to each other is always infinity. For the update step, use the vector table of the only neighboring node we have for the initial node. And lastly, to continue the update step, roughly n minus 1 iterations are used, where the value of n is equal to the number of nodes. For example, the model we took has 5 nodes that means we have to do a loop of 4 iterations. What is HDLC? Let's take a look. The HDLC stands for High Level Data Link Control. It refers to the bit oriented network protocol design to connect multiple network systems according to the communication requirement. The HDLC model applies the ARQ protocol for application and establishes a full duplex communication channel between the network devices. Moving on, we have the different types of HDLC stations available. HDLC stations can efficiently be differentiated into three different types, where the first type is primary station. In this station, it handles the establishing and de-establishing of the primary data channel to share different frames in the network channel, known as commands. It also performs the data management for the network. Moving on, we have the secondary station. This station work under the command of the primary station and the frames issued by the stations are known as responses. As for the last station, we have combined station. As the name suggests, this type of station is available for both commands and response value. Next, we will look into HDLC transfer models. The HDLC protocol supports two types of transfer models which are applied according to the need of communication channel where the first type is known as normal response model or in short NRM. This transfer model combines the primary station and the secondary station in a point-to-point -point or multi-point configuration to exchange commands from primary station and responses from the secondary station. And response to the multi connection. Moving on, we have the second type of transfer model, which is asynchronous balanced model. In this transfer model, the combined stations are installed in a point to point configuration for exchange of command or responses from either of the node. Moving on, let's take a look at the HDLC frame model and types. The data unit for sharing information in the HDLC protocol is known as frames. The HDLC frame consists of multiple frame fields which may vary according to the frame type. 
In general, the HDLC frame consists of five different frame fields, where the first field is flag field. In HDLC, each frame starts with the flag field in the configuration and is defined by an 8-bit octet sequence, which is 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0 in the flag field. Moving on, we have the address field. It encapsulates the receiver's address in the field. For example, if the frame is sent from the primary station, it contains the secondary station's address and vice versa. Next, we have the control field. This field contains the flow and error control information in byte format. Next, we have payload or the information field. It carries the actual information from the upper layer of the OSI model. And the last field is known as FCS field. This field stands for frame sequence check and acts as an error detection field in the HDLC protocol, which includes a 6-bit CRC check. Given is a frame format for an HDLC protocol with flag in the both ending and the starting point, followed by address field, control field, information field, and FCS field. Now let's take up a quiz to understand all the things we have learned so far. The question is, the HDLC protocol functions under which network layer in the OSI model? And the options are application layer, data link layer, physical layer, and the network layer. You can give your answers in the comment section. Now let's move on to different types of frame models available in HDLC. The frame models in HDLC can be classified of following three types depending upon the control field value of the frame. Where the first frame is known as I-frame. The I-frame stands for information frame and is applied to encapsulate the user information from the upper layer in the model and then transmit it to the network channel. Note, the first bit of the control field in this frame is always zero, which also acts as an identification point for I-frame. Moving on, we have the S-frame. The S-frame stands for supervisory frame and is used for error and data flow control and does not contain any information regarding the information field in the format. Note for the S frame is the first two bits of the control field is 1 and 0 which acts as an identification point for S frame. As for the last type of frame model we have U frame. The U frame stands for unnumbered frame used for system management and exchanging information between connected network devices. With this, we have covered all the relevant information regarding the HDLC protocol. The checksum is one of the most applied error detection method in the network channel and is a bit-based format detection method. The checksum uses checksum generator on the sender side to perform the checksum method and the checksum checker on the receiver side to check whether there is an error in the data or not. Let's continue with the next setting that is why to apply checksum method. Using the checksum method at the sender side, the checksum value is added to the original data to be transferred as an error detection method. Whereas at the receiver side, it decodes the incoming data from the sender side according to the checksum method to detect any changes in the given data. Now let's move on to the working steps involved in the checksum method. There are various steps involved in the checksum method. Let's take a look at the first step. That is, the first step begins at the sender side, where we divide the original data into k parts of n bits. Continuing with adding all the k blocks we have obtained, then the addition result is complemented using one's complement. The data now obtained is known as the checksum value. Next, let's look at the step 2. Data transmission. After we have received the checksum value, 
from the checksum method, we will add it to the front of the original data and transfer it to the network channel to the receiver side. Now, step 3. Step 3 begins at the receiver side. That is, it will divide, that is, the receiver side will divide the obtained original data plus the checksum value into K blocks and then add all the K blocks using addition. After that, we will complement the obtained data. If the complement of 1 comes out to be 0, that is, no errors are received in the data and the receiver will accept the data. Whereas, for case 2, if the result is not 0, the received data is damaged. So, the receiver will discard this data and request for retransmission of data from the sender side. Now, after understanding all the points regarding working of the checksum method, let's take a look at a solved example to better understand all the points. The question is, for the given data, perform the checksum method. This is how we divided all the four parts. Each of these represents a K block, that is 4 blocks and 8 bits in each of the block, that is N bits. Now, for the first step, that is at the sender side. We will add all the given data. So the value would come out to be 1000 0, 0, that would be 1, 0100 0, 0 would be 1, 0011 0, 1 would be 1 carry 0. So 1 carry plus 1 means 0 plus 1 carry again, 1 carry plus 1 means 0 and 1 carry again, 1 0 1 that is 1 carry 0 plus 1 plus 0 means 1. So 1 carry is over on the this side. 1 plus 0 is 1. 1 plus 1 is 1 carry 0. 0 plus 0 is 0. 0 plus 0 is 0 and 0. And we have 1 carry over here. So the obtained data would be 1 0 with extra bit as this. Now to resolve this issue, we will now add the extra carry to the obtained data from the addition part that would be 1010100. Now at the sender side we will do once complement for the obtained addition value that would come out to be 1101010 that is the checksum value. Now this value addition to the original data will be shared to the receiver side. Where at the receiver side, we will again perform the addition method and the value comes out to be this along with two digits of extra bit that is the carry. Again, similarly, we will add this carry to the addition value and get the new data that is all ones. Now, again going by the steps, we have to perform once complement for this value obtained that comes out to be all zeros. That means the checksum value is 0 at the receiver side, which indicates that there are no errors in the received data by the receiver side. With this, we have completed all the points regarding working of the checksum method. Now, to better understand all the steps, let's take up a quiz. That is, for the given data, find the checksum value, where the given options can be one of them. You can give your answers. In the comment section. What is parity bit check? The parity bit is a data check bit added to the original data for detecting errors at the receiver side by checking the integrity of the received data. The parity bit adds 1 or 0 to the original data that is to be transmitted to the receiver side and if in case there is an error in the received data, the sender side will do the parity check and give the request for retransmission of the data. Now, let's move on to the key points regarding parity bit check. To properly understand the working of parity bit check, we need to understand some key points, where the first one is redundant bits. They are the extra binary bits that are added explicitly 
to the original data to prevent the damage to the transmitted data or to detect the damage to the transmitted data. They are also used to recover the original data in case of a damage at the receiver end. The number of redundant bits added depends upon the type of check method used. Regarding which, in this example, there are four data bits used, whereas three redundant bits. It can also be two redundant bits or one redundant bit. In case of parity check method, only one redundant bit is added to the original data. Now let's move on to the next key point, that is parity bits. The parity bit check method is a method to add binary bits to secure the original data. That is done by counting the total number of ones in the original data, which is either even or odd in number. The parity bit check method is used to detect error in the original data at the receiver side and also in some cases it is used to correct the change. There are two types of parity bits available to choose from. The first one is odd parity bit. In this parity bit check, the number of ones in the original data including the parity bit should be odd in number. For example, in the given example, the number of green tiles has four ones that is even so the parity bit should be one in this case to make the total number of ones in the data five that is odd similarly the other parity bit is known as even parity bit in this case of parity type the total number of ones counted is to be even including the parity bit for example the number of ones in green tiles is four that is even. So, the value of parity bit should be 0 in this case. The point to be noted is, the parity bit value should always be correct because it acts as the error detection method at the receiver side. Now let's move on to the explained example to consolidate all the things we have learned so far. The question is, for the given data bit that is 110111 apply the even parity bit check for data transmission. Now let's begin. For the first step, let's take the original data that is 110111 and the parity bit value is to be given as p. Now, according to the next step, we have to count the number of ones in the original data, which will come out to be. 5 bits. That means there are 5 ones in the original data which represents an odd number. To balance this according to even parity bit, now we have to add 1 in place of p. So the new data to be transmitted will become 110, 111 and 1 which will be transmitted to the receiver side by the sender side. After the data has reached the receiver side, there are a few cases that may arise in the data. Where case 1 is the data bit received to transmission has no errors, that is, the data received is correct after applying the parity bit check, which in this case is even. So the transmitted data is this, and the received data is this. That means both the transmitted data and received data are same. That means the received data is correct. Then the second case arises is the data bit received to transmission has errors. That is the data received is damaged after applying the even parity check. Which in this case the transmitted data is and the received data has an 0 instead of 1. Which means the number of 1s in this case becomes 5 which does not match with the even parity check. So it has an error. And the last case, case 3, in this the data bit received through transmission has errors. That is the data received is correct according to the even parity bit. Because the transmitted data has 6 ones, whereas the received data has 4 ones. But 
According to even parity check, only the number of ones should be even. That means the number of ones received by the receiver side is 4. So according to parity bit check, it is valid. But according to the original data, the received data is wrong. These are the three main cases that may arise during the transmission of data through parity check method. The Hemming code method is a network technique that is designed to detect errors and correct data bits which are transmitted during data exchange. It was first implemented by RW Hamming, hence the name Hamming code. This network technique is implemented because during data transmission, there are often cases where data loss or data damage occurs. To recover or detect the damage in the original data, we use Hamming code. In the next slide, we will look into some terms that are related to the working of Hamming code. The first one being redundant bits. These are the extra binary bits that are added explicitly to the original data bit to prevent damage to the transmitted data and also to recover the original data in case of a damage at the receiver end. In the next point, we will look into some formula related to redundant bits and how to add them in the Hamming code. The formula related to redundant bits is 2R more than equal to M plus R plus 1, where M refers to the data bits in the data and R refers to the redundant bits. Let's take an example. In case M is equal to 4, that means the data bits used are 4, we need to find the value of R. Using the above formula, let's deduce the value of redundant bits. 2R is more than equal to 4 plus R plus 1. 2 to the power R is more than equal to R plus 5. So using this, let's use R equal to 0. If we use that, we will get a value 1 that is more than equal to R plus 5, but that is wrong. Then using R equal to 3, that is 8 is more than equal to 8. This way we conclude that the Hamming code would be 7 bit data because the value of R is 3 and M is 4. Now let's move on to the next term related to Hamming code that is parity bits. The parity bit is a method to append binary bits to secure that the total number of counts of 1 in the original data is either even number or an odd number. Let's take a look why do we exactly use parity bits. They are used to detect error in the original data which occurs during the transmission of data. Through this method, we can detect the error at the receiver end and also correct it. Let's take a look at different types of parity bits available. First one is even parity bit. In this case of parity type, the total number of ones counted is to be even in the count. In case the count is odd, then the value of parity is 1. Otherwise, the value should be 0. Similarly, the other parity bit is known as odd parity bit. For this parity bit, the total number of ones counted in the original data should be odd. If that is the case, the value of parity bit should be 0. And in case the value of ones in the original data comes out to be odd, then the parity value would be 1. Now let's move on to the next setting. That is the working example of the Hamming code. Let's take a look. Let's begin with the steps to be followed to solve a Hamming code issue. The first point being the position of the parity bit is determined using 2 to the power n term, where n represents the number series 0 to n. Assigning the position for parity bit using this method would be more clear during an example. For the second point we have, the remaining positions represent the data bit. 
Now let's try using the value of parity width for n is equal to 0. That means 2 to the power 0 is equal to 1. So all the bits with 1 in the last position are used to determine the value of the parity bit. To better understand the assignment value of parity bit, please focus on this mentioned table. In this table, we can take a look at the last position that is n is equal to 0 and see the mentioned number. For p1, we can use a value 1 because n is equal to 0 and the last position value is 1. Then is number 3 because the last position bit is 1. Then similarly for number 5 because n is equal to 0 and the bit value is 1. So these three parity value can be used for n is equal to 0. Similarly, let's take a look when the n is equal to 1. That means 2 to the power 1 is equal to 2. So all the bits with 1 in the second position are used to determine the value of parity bit. Now let's take a look at the table to identify the numbers related to this parity bit value. The first one being 2 due to the presence of one bit in the second position. Then we have P3, presence of one bit in the second position. Similarly, the next would be number six, due to the presence of one bit in the second position. Similarly, let's take a look at when n is equal to two. That means two to the power two is equal to four. So all the bits with one in the third position are used to determine the value of parity bit and this would be 4, 5 and 6 number. Please read the points very carefully because next we will solve an example to better clarify all the concepts. Let's move on. The given example is the data bit to be transmitted is 1011. And we have to solve this using the Hamming Court method. So the first step would be applying the Hamming Court method and identify the given number of data bits. That would be 4 according to the question. So the number of parity bit would be 3, where the value would be 1, 2, and 4 according to the power of p expression. That means we will get something similar to this. This representation is in data bits format where the first position is for p1 parity bit, the second for 2 to the power 1 that is 2 p2 and the third one is for 2 to the power 4 that is p4 parity. And let's put the value that is to be transmitted in the remaining positions that would be P1, P2, 1, P4, 1, 0 and 1. Using this bit value, we will deduce the value of P1, P2 and P4 for data transmission. In this case, we are using even parity for the example. That means the number of 1s should be even. Let's take a look. For P1, we have D1, D3, D5 and D7 as mentioned in the earlier slide. So the value would be P1, comma 1, comma 1 and comma 1 according to the data bits available to us by the question. That means the value would be 1 because the number of 1s for P1 is odd. So to make it even the value of P1 would be 1. Similarly for P2 we have D2, D3, D6 and D7. Using the same method, we will get P2, 1, 0, 1. So the number of 1s for P2 is even. So the P2 value would be 0. Next is for P4. The value is D4, D5, D6 and D7. Where P4 has 1, 0 and 1. That means the number of 1s is even. So again P4 is equal to 0. Now using this we get the new bit 
that is to be transmitted that is 1010101 after transmission in case let's say at position 5 an error occurs and the value of 1 is converted to 0 to detect this error at the receiver side we will use the hamming code to begin with we will use the parity value to cross check the original data bit that means let's do the parity bit method for this received data so for p1 we have d1 d3 d5 and d7 so the number of ones is odd that means the value of p1 should be 1 to make it even then for p2 we have d2 d3 d6 and d7 so the number of ones is even that means the p2 value would be 0 now let's move on for p4 that would be 4 d5 d6 and d7 number of ones is 1 that means odd so the value of p4 would be 1 now let's take a look at the results that we obtained using this method for most this shows that the data transmitted is damaged and we can detect the error position using this method that is using the value of parity bits obtained where this will lead to 2 to the power expression that means 2 to the power 0 plus 0 plus 2 to the power that means 5 that matches with the assumption we took now to correct this error we can use the position that we obtained that is 5 and replace the zeroth value with one bit by doing this we will obtain the original data Now let's move on to the first heading that is introduction to the protocol. The stop and wait protocol is a type of flow control mechanism active in the OSI model of the data link layer. The transmission of data applies only to the noiseless channels where a noiseless channel represents an ideal network channel where no frames are lost, duplicated or hacked. Moving on, we have The stop and wait protocol is unidirectional in transmission of data that is either sending or receiving data will only takes place at an instance For the third point we have the stop and wait protocol as the name suggests is when the sender shares a data packet to the receiver end then the sender side has to stop and wait for the receiver side to send an acknowledgement before it starts sending the next data packet with this point we are now knowledgeable about the working of the stop and wait protocol at an elementary level now let's move on to the next heading the next heading for the session is steps involved in the stop and wait protocol the steps for this protocol are divided into two parts sender and receiver protocol Let's start with the sender side. The first step is to transmit one data unit at a time to the receiver end by the sender side. And the next step is to transmit the next data until only after we receive the acknowledgement from the receiver end. Now let's move on to the receiver side. In receiver side, step 1 is to receive the data and use the data that is being sent then the second step is after the data has been used by the receiver side it will send the acknowledgement to the sender side for further data transmission this is how the transmission of data takes place in the data protocol now let's move on to the next heading that is working of stop and wait protocol using the previous two headings we can easily determine the steps involved in this working let's take a look to begin with we have two sides the sender and the receiver side the first step is to send the data from the sender side to the receiver end 
and after the receiver side has used the data it will send the acknowledgement signal meanwhile the sender side has to wait for the acknowledgement signal only after it receives the acknowledgement signal will it send the next data packet now that the sender side has sent the data for the second time the receiver side will use this data and then only share the acknowledgement signal this process of sending data from the sender side to the receiver side and receiving acknowledgement from the receiver side to the sender side continues for n number of times according to the given scenario in the network channel now let's move on to the next heading that is also the last heading for this session that is drawbacks of using stop and wait protocol the first drawback of using this protocol is the loss of data this issue can arise when transmitting data from the sender side to the receiver end it may be due to any issue due to hacking attempt or network disruption or any other network related issue then this can also arise when receiving acknowledgement from the receiver side now let's move on to the second drawback the next issue is related to acknowledgement transmission that is during the transmission of acknowledgement signal due to the network issues the acknowledgement signal is disrupted and the transmission is terminated this can arise again due to any reasons that are occurring in the network channel now let's move on to the last drawback for this heading the last issue occurs due to the delay in transmission time of the information time delay drawback can occur on either side of the transmission that is during data transmission or the acknowledgement transmission as we know in a networking concept protocols refers to the rules and instructions that governs the data transmission between different network models and devices in a communication channel the data transmitted using protocols is easily handled and is reliable to use as well as it provides a secure channel for the data to be transmitted now let's move on to the different types of protocols available in a network channel the protocols available in a network channel can be divided into two different types noiseless channels and noisy channels where the noise part refers to any external interference data error or duplicate transmission in the network channel furthermore noiseless channels and noisy channels can be divided into subdivisions let's take a look at the noiseless channels first noiseless channels can be divided into two types simplest type and stop and wait type whereas noisy channels are divided into three subdivisions stop and wait arq go back and arq selective repeat arq in the noisy channel go back and arq and selective repeat arq are the ones that apply the sliding window protocol for data transmission over the network channel now let's look into some information regarding sliding window protocol to begin with the sliding window protocol is a technique that allows the share of multiple data frames in a network channel where the number of frames shared is determined by the window size assigned to the network channel also the frames sent during transmission are assigned with a sequence number for efficient frame transmission in the communication channel till this point in the video we have already learned about the definition of what is the sliding window protocol now let's look into the working steps of the sliding window protocol to begin with we have a sender side and a receiver side in the network channel then we require the frames where each frame is given a sequence number for this example we are using 0 to 8 which means a total of 9 frames are available at the sender side then using the window size we determine the number of frames that can be shared at an instance for example we'll be using 3 as a window size for this example 
let's start with sending the first frame that is 0 to the receiver side. After the frame is sent, a sliding window appears on the number of frames. Now let's move on to the next that is frame 1. The point to be noted is before receiving any acknowledgement we have to send all the frames that are available according to the window size that is for this example the window size is 3 that means we have to send 3 frames before we receive any acknowledgement from the receiver side. Let's send the last frame that is frame 2. Now we have to wait for the receiver side to send the acknowledgement signal to the sender side before we can send the next frame. Now that we have shared the maximum number of frames, the receiver end will share the acknowledgement signal for frame 0 with the sender side. After this acknowledgement is received by the sender side, we can share the next frame in the list that is frame 3. After the frame 3 has been sent, see the positioning of the sliding window. The sliding window now changes from 0, 1, 2 to 1, 2, and 3 frame. This positioning of the sliding window represents that 0th frame has already been acknowledged by the receiver side, whereas the 3rd frame is sent for acknowledgement from the receiver side by the sender side. And similarly, we have to do the same pattern for the next two frames, that is frame number 1 and frame number 2. Now, the sender side will receive the acknowledgement for frame 1 from the receiver side. And we can send frame 4 from the sender side to the receiver side. Now, see the movement of the sliding window. The sliding window changes from 1, 2 and 3 frame number to 2, 3 and 4. Similarly, we can move on to the last frame. Now let's draw some simple conclusion from all the working steps we have seen so far. To begin with, frame number 1 and 0 represents the acknowledged frames, whereas the frames within the sliding window represents the frames that are waiting acknowledgement whereas the remaining frames 5, 6, 7 and 8 are not yet shared with the receiver side. Now let's move on to the next heading for the session. Difference between stop and wait protocol and sliding window protocol. The first comparison is on the basis of working mechanism where the stop and wait protocol is designed to send the data frame at a single time and wait for the receiver to send the acknowledgement to share the next frame. As for the sliding window protocol, sender can send multiple frames simultaneously and then wait for the corresponding acknowledgement from the receiver end. Let's move on to the next comparison that is based on the window size. On the basis of window size, the stop and wait protocol is always fixed at 1. As for sliding window protocol, as we saw in earlier slides, it varies according to the scenario in the network channel. Let's take a look at some other comparisons too. The next comparison is based on efficiency and time delay. As comparison on this basis, the stop and wait protocol is efficiently low and suffers from more time delay. As for sliding window protocol, the efficiency is higher than the stop and wait protocol, which provides lower time delay during data transmission. Let's move on to the last comparison. Sorting and transmission of data. For stop and wait protocol, sorting is not required and it applies half duplex system for data transmission. As for sliding window protocol, we require sorting for better efficiency and is full duplex in nature. With this, we have reached the end of the video. Now let's look into some information about the GoBack and ARQ protocol. This protocol applies the sliding window method for transmission of data in the network channel, where n in the protocol refers to the window size assigned in the network model. 
as for the term ARQ in the protocol refers to the automatic repeat request, which means the sender side will send multiple data frames to the receiver side according to the assigned window size. And only after it receives an acknowledgement from the receiver side will it continue to send the frames from the sender side. Moving on, let's look into some important points regarding the protocol. As to begin with, the method applied to share multiple frames from the sender side to the receiver side is known as the protocol pipelining, where each frame is assigned a sequence number for proper transmission of data in the network channel. Now let's move on to some other important points. As we already know, the N in the protocol refers to the window size that is the maximum limit of frames that can be transmitted from the sender to the receiver side before reaching the acknowledgement for the previous frame. And in case if the transmission of the acknowledgement of a frame is not received within a certain time period, then all the frames from that sequence number are to be retransmitted in the channel. This point is to be remembered properly because this will be the key point in solving a question related to go back in ARQ protocol. Now let's move on to the working of the protocol. To begin with, we have a sender side and a receiver side along with the sequence number, the window size for the network channel and the number of frames will already be assigned in the network. Now, by applying the sliding window protocol, we will send the first three frames from the sequence continuously, which will be frame number 0, frame number 1 and 2. This is assigned according to the window size. After sending the frames, we will have a sliding window over the sequence numbers that are 0, 1 and 2. After the frames are sent to the receiver side, it will use the frames and send an acknowledgement signal to the sender side. That would be zero for the first time. After which we can share the next frame that will be frame number three from the sender side to the receiver side. After sending frame three, the sliding window from sequence number zero one to two to shift over to 1, 2 and 3. And similarly, for frame number 1, we will receive the acknowledgement signal from the receiver side to the sender side. And then we can share the next frame that is frame number 4 from the sender side to the receiver side. And the sliding window will shift over from sequence number 1, 2 and 3 to over 2, 3 and 4. As for the next frame, that is frame number 2, when we receive the acknowledgement from the receiver side, there is a catch. For any network issues, the acknowledgement is not received by the sender side. So in this case, as discussed earlier in one of the important points, the sender side will not transmit frame number 5. Instead, it will retransmit frame number 2. 3 and 4 where the second frame is the one which did not receive the acknowledgement and all the frames sent after second frame is to be retransmitted along with it that is 3 and 4. To much better understand the solution for the example we will be solving later in the video it is suggested that you watch the steps involved in the working of the go back and ARQ protocol again. Now moving forward, let's take a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of using the protocol in a network channel. For advantages we have, it increases the efficiency of transmission of frames. It also allows multiple frames to be sent at once and the time delay is low for sharing the packets. As for disadvantages we have, the retransmission of frames 
in case of an error in the network channel is a very difficult work. And it also requires the storing of frames on the receiver side that it receives from the center side. Now that we have learned everything about the go back and ARQ protocol, let's take a look at the much awaited working example for the same. Let's take a look at the problem statement. In a given network, the number of frames provided is 10, with the window size assigned as 3, and for every fourth packet is lost. Find the total number of messages or frames sent from the sender side to the receiver side. From this question, we can get three main parts that are the number of frames that are given is 10. As for the window size is 3 and every fourth packet is lost. Let's take a look at the options. Option A 27, Option B 25, Option C 22 and Option D 29. I'll give you guys a moment to take a look at the question again. Now let's move on to the solution. As usual, we have the sender side and a receiver side. And according to the question, we have 10 frames. Numbering the frames sequentially, we have frame 1 to frame 10. And then according to the question, we have window size as 3. Now, using the sliding window method, we'll send the first three frames, that is frame number 1, 2, and 3, from the sender side to the receiver side. That will be like this. After sending the frames, we'll wait for the receiver side to send the acknowledgement and a sliding window will appear on frame number 1, 2 and 3. Now the receiver side will send the acknowledgement for frame 1 to the sender side. And using this, we can send frame number 4 from the sender side to the receiver side. And a sliding window appear on 2, 3 and 4 sequence number. And similarly, for frame number 2, we will send the acknowledgement from receiver side to the sender side. And send frame number 5 from sender to the receiver side. And a sliding window appears on sequence number 3, 4 and 5. Then again, for frame number 3, we will send the acknowledgement from the receiver side to the sender side. And send frame number 6 from the sender to the receiver side and a sliding window appear on frame number 4, 5 and 6. Now let's move on for the next frame for acknowledgement that is frame number 4. For this frame, according to the given question, every fourth frame is lost during transmission from the sender side to the receiver side. That means no acknowledgement will be sent from the receiver side to the sender side for frame number 4 in that regards or any other frame that are sent after frame number 4, that is frame number 5 and frame number 6. Similarly, frame number 5 and frame number 6 will also get discarded. Now, let's retransmit according to the go back and ARQ protocol. Frame number 4, frame number 5 and frame number 6. After retransmission, frame number 4 will get acknowledged by the receiver side to the sender side. That means we can send next frame that is frame number 7 from the sequence order. And the sliding window appears on frame number 5, 6 and 7. Similarly, let's move on to frame number 5. But before we do that, let's count the position of fifth frame in the transmission order. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and 8. That's correct. When we count the position number for any of the frames from the beginning, we use sequence, not the sequence number given by the question. That means 5th 
frame is at the position number 8 from the beginning. That means according to the question it will get lost during the transmission from sender to the receiver side. Similarly, frame number 6 and frame number 7 that was sent after 5th frame will also get discarded. According to the go back in ARQ protocol again, we will retransmit 5, 6 and 7 frame number to receiver side from the sender side. After retransmission, frame number 5 will get acknowledged by the receiver side and then we can share frame number 8 from the sender to the receiver side and the positioning of the sliding window shift from 5, 6, 7 frame to 6, 7 and 8 sequence number. Now let's move on to the 6th frame. But according to the positioning order, position of the 6th transmitted frame is number 12. That means it will get loss during transmission from sender to the receiver side. And similarly, frame number 7 and 8 will also get discarded by the receiver side. And again, applying go back in our queue protocol, we will retransmit frame number 6, 7 and 8. On retransmission, frame number 6 will get acknowledged by the receiver side and we can share frame number 9 from the sender to the receiver side and the sliding window will shift from sequence number 6, 7 and 8 to 7, 8 and 9. Now let's recount the position of the next frame that is frame number 7 from the beginning and that would be 16. That means frame number 7 will get lost during transmission from the sender to the receiver side. And similarly, frame number 7, 8 and 9 is to be retransmitted according to the go back and ARQ protocol. Now similarly, following all the previous steps, we can complete this network model using go back and ARQ protocol. But this is a work you guys have to complete and find out the total number of packets that were transmitted from the sender to the receiver side and give your answers in the comment section. And the next heading is, what is selective repeat ARQ protocol? For the first point in selective repeat ARQ protocol, we have is the working principle. The working principle of the ASRP protocol is based on sliding window protocol, and it uses a buffer system for storing either at the center side or the receiver side during the data transmission. Let's move on to the next point for selective repeat ARQ. The term ARQ in the protocol defines the automatic repeat request, process that is designed to perform the task of sending the next frame for each of the acknowledged frame. Now, let's move on to the next heading. Next heading is important points about the protocol. For the first point we have is the value of n that represents the window size is same for both sides. That is the value of sender size is equal to the window size of the receiver side. Let's take a look at the next point. In case of selected repeat ARQ protocol, as the name suggests, in case the frame is not received by the receiver side or the acknowledge is not received by the sender side, as shown in the diagram. In this case, the mentioned frame is to be retransmitted without affecting any other frame. Let's move on to the next point for this heading. In case the frame is not received by the receiver side, then it will share a negative acknowledgement signal to the sender side so that it can retransmit the damaged frame. This point forms the basis of the working process involved in the SRP protocol. So please take a note of this point. Now let's move forward 
with the working of the protocol. We'll divide the working process of the SRP protocol in multiple steps for better understanding. Let's move on for the first step. To begin with, we have a sender side and the receiver side as usual. Then we have a sequence of numbers and a window size. Now, for the second step, let's send the first data frame that is frame 0. Next is frame 1, frame 2, and frame 3. These four frames are sent for the beginning because our window size is 4. And a sliding window appears from sequence number 0 to sequence number 3. After the receiver side have received the sender side's frames, it will acknowledge the first frame, that is frame 0, and send the acknowledgement signal to the sender side. After the sender side receives the first acknowledgement signal, it will again share the next frame in the sequence, that is frame number 4. And the sliding window will shift from frame 0 to 3 to 1 to 4. Now similarly, let's acknowledge frame number 1 from the receiver side to the sender side. And the sender side will share the next frame in the sequence, that is frame number 5 to the receiver side. And the sliding window will shift from frame 1 to 4 to sequence number 2 to 5. Now, let's acknowledge frame number 2. Okay, now let's assume that frame number 2 is lost or corrupted during the transmission. In this case, if we apply go back in ARQ protocol, all the frames sent after frame number 2 are to be retransmitted. That will be frame number 2, 3, 4 and 5. But in case of SRP protocol, that is selective repeat ARQ protocol, only the frame that is lost during transmission is to be retransmitted. That means the acknowledgement signal for frame number 3 will be sent from the receiver side to the sender side. And the sender side will then retransmit frame number 2 to the receiver side. This process of retransmitting only the lost frame is known as the selective repeat ARQ protocol. And similarly, we will acknowledge the next frame that is frame number 4. And send the next frame that will be frame number 6. As you can see, in this process of SRP protocol, the sliding window or the window size clearly does not play any particular role. With the completion of this slide, we are done with the whole working steps involved in the SRP protocol. Now let's move on to the next heading in the video. Choose from over 300 in-demand skills and get access to 1,000 plus hours of video content for free. Visit SkillUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. The next heading in this session is difference between selective repeat ARQ protocol and go back in ARQ protocol. Let's take a look. For the first point we have, in go back in RQ protocol, it does not require a large amount of memory as it does not provide the buffer feature for the network model. Whereas in case of selective repeat ARQ protocol, it requires a buffer system. So the memory needed is more on both the sides, that is the sender side and the receiver side. Now let's move on to the next point. All the frames after the lost frame in go back in RQ protocol are to be retransmitted, as we already discussed in the earlier slide. Whereas in case of selective repeat ARQ protocol, only the damaged or the lost frame is to be retransmitted. Let's take a look at some other points too. In go back in RQ protocol, too many retransmission frames are required. So the efficiency of the overall model is very low. And in case of SRP protocol, the retransmission frames is less. 
so the efficiency of the overall model is increased. Let's take a look at the last point for the difference. The bandwidth required for go back in our queue protocol is too high due to the more retransmission frames. As for SRP protocol, moderate bandwidth requirement is needed. With the completion of difference between SRP protocol and go back in our queue protocol, the user datagram protocol, commonly known as UDP protocol, is designed to be unreliable and connectionless in nature, which applies process to process communication model for data exchange between devices and is active in the transport layer of the OSI model and is used to transfer data and information related to internet services over the network channel where process to process communication refers to the use of port numbers in the header format during the transmission of data over the network channel as for connectionless it means that the UTP format does not provide established path for the data to transfer instead it uses multiple different paths which we will look into further in the video let's move on to the next heading features of using user datagram protocol the user datagram protocol provides the network with ways efficient and easy to understand network protocol features to apply over the data that is to be transmitted where the first feature of UDP is related to the working area that is the UDP model is a transport layer protocol of the OSI model and is used to deliver best effort delivery options for the data transmission where the best delivery option refer that the protocol does not provide the sender will receive any acknowledgement from the receiver side for the data transmitted or it does not provide any guarantee of data transmitted to the receiver side. Now let's move on to the second feature of user datagram protocol. The second feature represents the mode of delivery or connection that the UDP establishes for data transmission. The UDP protocol as we know already establishes a connectionless path. That means there's no actual virtual path for the data to be transmitted. So that the each data from the UDP format uses a random path available in the network channel and reaches its destination. Now let's move on to the next heading that is UDP header format. The UDP header format comprises of two parts. First the UDP header part which is 8 bytes in size and second the data to be transmitted. Furthermore the header part is divided into four different parts. Source port, destination port, total length and checksum where each of the parts are divided into 16 bits. <laughs> Let's take a look at the different parts of the header format in a little detail. The first one is source port number. It is a 16 bit value that is used to identify the port that is transmitting the data. Next is destination port number that is used to identify the port number that will be receiving the data on the receiver end. Next we have total length. As the name suggests, this value is used to specify the total length of the UDP packet including the UDP header part. And the last is checksum. This is a 16-bit value field and is used as an optional attribute. It is left empty if there is no need or it is used in case where accuracy of the data is to be measured. Now let's move on to the working of the UDP protocol. To begin with we have data from the sender side which is enclosed with the UDP header for communication and data in the UDP header part. The next step is to hand over this data over to the IP section for encapsulization with the IP header and data with the UDP header and data part. As for the last step, this part is handed over to the frame section where it is transformed with the frame header and data format. Moving on, now let's transmit the data over the network channel for the receiver end to receive it. Over to the receiver side, first step is 
decoding of frame header part and data part into the IP section, which contains IP header and data section. Again, this IP packet is divided into UDP header part and data part, from where the message is retrieved from the data section of the UDP header format and is then received by the receiver end. Now let's move on to the applications of UTP protocol. Let's take a look at some of the features of the UTP protocol that provides applications to various network models. For the first one we have, it provides flow control and error control mechanism to the network model such as TFTP. Next, it provides faster transmission of data as there is no pre-established virtual path needed. So it is used for real-time services, live communication, and gaming services. Now let's move on to the last setting for this session, that is UDP versus TCP protocol. We will differentiate between UDP and TCP based on some attributes that are mostly used in a network model. And the first attribute is reliability. For UDP protocol, as we already know now, it is an unreliable in nature. That is, it does not provide any guarantee of data transmitted to the destination site is reached or not. As for TCP, it provides reliable and guaranteed data delivery to the receiver site. The next attribute is acknowledgement signal. The UDP protocol does not provide any acknowledgement from the receiver side to the sender side. Whereas in case of TCP protocol, sharing the acknowledgement signal is very important. If the acknowledgement signal is not shared by the receiver side to the sender side, the data exchange will halt. Let's move on to the next attribute, that is connection mode. As we already know now, UDP is a connectionless mode of service. There is no virtual path established for the data transmission to take place. Whereas for TCP protocol, it is a connection oriented protocol that is a virtual path is needed for the data to be transmitted over to the receiver side or the destination node. The next attribute is error check system. In UDP protocol basic check system is only used for error check. Whereas for TCP protocol it is an extensive error check service and along with error flow control mechanism included in the TCP protocol service. Let's take a look at today's agenda. Firstly, we will understand what exactly the DHCP protocol is. Then the allocation methods in DHCP protocol. Next, we will understand some helpful DHCP settings. And lastly, stepwise, we will understand the operation model for DHCP. Let's understand the DHCP protocol. The dynamic host protocol or DHCP is a protocol that is designed to assign the IP address to a device for it to access the internet. This network model is based on the client server architecture and removes the process of manually assigning an IP address to the system. Now let's take a look at the allocation methods for the DHCP protocol. The allocation method of DHCP is divided into two types. The first type is the manual allocation, which as the name suggests is the assigning of IP address to the system manually by the user. The second method is dynamic allocation, which uses a client server architecture to assign an IP address to the system. Now let's see some points regarding the allocation method. The first type is the manual allocation. As mentioned, in this allocation type, the user manually assigns the IP address to the system for accessing the internet and can be observed in this instance. This is done by accessing the network configuration setting of the device and also requires other related configuration such as subnet mask, preferred DNS server and default gateway. Let's now take a look at the dynamic allocation. In this allocation method, the client device receives all the relevant network configurations from the DHCP server and the system gets configured to access the internet. The provided IP address is given for a certain period, which is also termed as the lease. 
Now that we somewhat understand what exactly the dynamic allocation in DHCP server is, let's take a look at a small example. Open the start menu and type command prompt. When the windows open up, type ip config slash all command. As we see, by this command we can take a look at the network settings for our system. Over here we can see the DHCP is enabled. That means the configuration that has been used on the system refers to the DHCP server. And on the bottom side we can take a look at the different network settings that are given along with the IP address by the DHCP server. That is subnet mask, default gateway and the DNS server. Now let's continue with our video. Now let's take a look at some of the notable DHCP settings. The first one is known as scope. As the name suggests, a scope refers to a range of addresses that are available to a DHCP server for allocation of the client device. Next we have is lease. This setting of the DHCP server is designed to prevent the hoarding of IP addresses by a single device. This is done by assigning an expiration date to the leased IP address so that the DHCP server has some minimum addresses left for the client device. And lastly we have address reservation. In this DHCP setting, the client device requests the server to assign the same IP address to the device each time the address allocation takes place. This is done by identifying the MAC address of the client device. Now let's take a look at the operation model for DHCP protocol. The DHCP operations are performed under user datagram protocol, in short UDP, which is applied on two ports under UDP, which are ports 67 and 68. The first phase is where the client broadcasts a DHCP server message over the network to connect with the DHCP server. This message basically means that it wants to connect to the internet through the DHCP server. The second phase is when the DHCP server receives the DHCP message. According to the message, the DHCP server reserves an IP address for the client and network configuration information including subnet mask, default gateway and preferred DNS server. In the third phase, the client responds to the DHCP server's offer through a DHCP request message, requesting the offer IP address and relevant network configuration for the system. Then in the last phase, the server acknowledges the request broadcast from the client and sends the DHCP packet to the DHCP client, which is comprised of network configuration for the client device. To begin practicing the commands, we need to access the command prompt application using the cmd command in the start menu. Now, let's begin with the list of commands. The first command is ipconfig. This command displays the system's basic IP address configuration data, which includes network information about IP addresses, subnet masks, and default gateway. Similarly, we also have ipconfig slash all command, which displays all the details regarding our device, like LAN settings, physical address of the system, IP addresses, subnet masks, and DHCP information. Let's use the CLS command to clear the application window for the next one. The next command is hostname, which is used to access the system's hostname. To verify this, let's use the ipconfig slash all command to check the hostname in the information and for sure, we have the same hostname. Let's perform the CLS command again and perform the next command. The ping command is used to check the communication availability of the destination host and the user system. For example, use the ping command with google.com to check the server availability, which gives us the following result. Also, using the results IP address and then the ping command, we can get the same result in case we just don't have the domain name. We perform the CLS command again and move on to the next one. The nslookup command is used to troubleshoot network connectivity and find the IP address of a domain like Google and Amazon as applied just now, to receive the name and address of the domain. 
Also, using the nslookup command and then applying the server command with an IP address, we can get the domain name belonging to the IP address. And similarly, to check the number of servers with the same domain name, we can do this and we have four name servers for Google. We perform the CLS command again and move on to the next one. The tracert command is used to troubleshoot the routing issues of the network by displaying the routing table through which the data is transmitted to a maximum of 30 hops in the network as you can see. Similarly, you can also try Amazon.com and share your views in the comment section below. Now let's clear the application window and perform the next command which is the ARP command. This command is applied to display the communication exchange between the IP address and the system's MAC or physical address. Let's move on to the next command which is the path ping command. This combines the tracer and ping commands and displays detailed information as an output for a maximum of 30 hops in the network. This command takes some time to compile the full hop details so that you can share findings in the comment section. Next we have the netstat command. It's used to display the network connection summary of the system as shown in the demo. Similarly, if we use the netstat-n command, it will give us much more details about the connection and UDP details. Next, we have the netshare command, which displays the details of where the data resources for our system are shared and we can check them under the share name, resources and remark column. Then we have the route command that allows us to access the routing tables and also allows us to make changes to them. Let's try the route print command and we have the interface list, IPv4 routing table details with all the active routes and the IPv6 routing table. Moving on, let's clear the window and look at the netsh command. The netsh is a popular command which allows us to view and configure the network adapters in the system. Under the netsh command, we have multiple functions for configuring settings. Let's try the show command and we have the following result. Moving on, we have the task list command that lists all the currently working applications on the system with task or program ID and the memory it uses. Let's perform an example, access Google Chrome and then perform the task list command. And as expected, we have the Chrome details in the list. And if we close the Chrome window and again use the task list command, we don't have the application active. Similarly, we also have the task kill command which will terminate the task corresponding to the given program ID in the command window. For example, let's access Chrome and perform the task list command to check the program ID. And then we'll use it with the task kill command and we can see that the application is terminated. To check our result, we can access the task list command again. Next on the list, we have the system info command. It's used to view all the information about the system from the Windows version to the BIOS and booting configuration. You can access all these details using the system info command. And the last network command for this session is the WMIC command. For getting detailed information on the ports and functions of the system like CPU details and then similarly, we can check the BIOS settings. Let's start off with question one. What is the OSI model? Explain the different layers of the OSI model. OSI largely is a theoretical model uh, utilized to understand networking and how data packets are created and how they are being processed by a computer. This is normally used by the TCP IP, the Transmission Control Protocol over Internet Protocol so software suite. So OSI is known as the Open Systems Interconnection Model. It is a reference model that describes how applications are going to interact via the computer network. There are seven different layers that we need to understand. They are as follows. So in this diagram, there are these seven different layers. We start off from the bottom. First is the physical layer, the data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation and application. When uh, such a question is asked in an interview, it is not only that we identify these seven layers, explaining what the OSI model is in the first place. We then try to identify these seven layers and we give a brief description about each and every layer. If there are any additional questions, they will come after uh, this basic question. 
So let's start off with the physical layer. This is the lowest layer of the OSI model. Now this is where any and every physicality of your computer comes into the picture. So it could be a uh, network interface card, it could be an RJ45 or a CAT5 cable, anything that allows data to be transmitted physically from your machine to another machine. Next comes the data link layer. So on the data link layer, as far as networking is concerned, we just need to understand that data packet is encoded, decoded into bits at this layer. This is also the layer that deals with MAC addressing. So the physical address of every net network interface card, which is the MAC address, which is utilized to route data packets over the network. This is where the MAC address resides on the data link layer. The next layer is the network layer. Here, datagrams are transferred from one to another. The function of this layer are routing and logical addressing. The moment we talk about routing and logical addressing, IP addresses come into the picture. IP version 4, IP version 6. So, network layer will deal with IP addressing and the routing of those packets. Then comes the transport layer. This is the uh, layer responsible for end-to-end -end connections. That automatically signifies that this is where TCP and UDP will be working. TCP stands for Transmission Control Protocol, UDP for User Datagram Protocol. TCP is a connection-oriented protocol, whereas UDP is a connection-less protocol. These two protocols are utilized to establish connectivity between two machines. TCP is a more reliable method of connectivity because there are a lot of packets that are sent across to verify that the data has been sent, data has been received and so on and so forth. Whereas UDP is a connection less protocol where data is just dumped without verifying whether the receiver actually receives that data or not. So in a nutshell, on the transport layer, TCP and UDP make their appearance and this is where that functionality lies. Then comes the session layer. This controls signals between the computer. It establishes, maintains, and terminates connections between processes. So in the transport layer, we talked about TCP and UDP. UDP being a connection-less protocol where data is just transmitted without verifying whether the receiver received that data or not. Whereas TCP, we studied, is more of a reliable protocol. Thus, there are different packets, signals that will be sent across to verify that data has been transmitted, it has been received properly and then the next uh, segment of that data is being sent. So those control signals are established using the session layer. So the three-way handshake of TCP, the acknowledgement packets, and uh, those kind of packets will be taken, taken care of on the session layer of the OSI model. Then comes the presentation layer. The presentation layer is responsible to translate data into the application layer format. So the formatting, right? MIME or encoding that is uh, being utilized, uh, the UTF-8 character set that we utilize for uh, presentation, encryption uh, mechanisms, all of these work on the presentation layer. And finally comes the application layer, where the application itself uses a particular protocol so that the other uh, machine on the receiving end, the application on that machine will be able to understand what the communication was about, right? So in a nutshell, if, if I start from up top, the application layer will deal with any of the data that the application uh, is generating. So maybe a user input, you're logging in, you're typing the username, password, all that data will be constructed, let's say into an HTTP or an HTTPS format. That's where your application layer comes into picture. Then the formatting of which into UTF-8, uh, and the encryption of which would be done at the presentation layer. Then this uh, transport layer and the session layer would kick in to establish a TCP session, do the three-way handshake, establish that connectivity. IP addressing would be done on the network layer. MAC addressing would be done on the data link layer. And when everything is ready on the physical layer, the packet will be sent out. At the receiving end, the packet will be received on the physical layer and then all these layers will be reversed. And finally, at the application layer, the data would be presented to the application who would then execute it and showcase it on the screen of the recipient. So this is the way you want to explain this question. You want to be very concise, precise about what you're explaining. You don't want to go into two hypothetical scenarios. You don't want to dilly-dally with the layers. You just want to give the basic functionality. You want to demonstrate that you understand what the OSI layer is, how the computer functions, and you want to move on from there. If the interviewer has any further follow-up questions, they will ask those specific questions.
So that's question one. Moving on to the question two. Question two is define unicasting, multicasting and broadcasting. Now this is a question which can be very lengthy, but again, most of your interview questions are designed that way. It's basically to understand how much conceptually you are aware about these technologies. So you have to be very concise. Don't go uh, rattling about technology too much. But in a concise manner, just try to explain what these things is. So when data is being transmitted over a network, it can be trans transmitted either in one of these particular manners. It can either be a unicast, multicast or a broadcast. So what is unicast? Unicast is when a message is sent from a single user to a single receiver. So one to one, right? So uh, one machine talking to uh, another machine and nobody else. So also known as point to point communications, one point to one of the point. If you have to send information to multiple receivers, then you will have to send it using multicast, right? So this is where your multicast networking comes into picture. So in our case, uh, let's assume it's a network where there are, uh, there's a class C network, approximately 255 odd machines. And within these, there are two machines that want to talk to each other. If they want to talk between each other, it would be a point to point communication where they will utilize unicast where only these two machines will have visibility of that conversation and the other machines will not even realize that this conversation is taking place. If one machine wants to talk to multiple machines, then the multicast comes into the picture. As the name suggests, in this mode of communication, data is sent from one or more, or more sources to multiple destinations. Multicast uses the internet group management protocol, also known as the IGMP protocol, to identify groups. So under this IGMP protocol, various groups are created where machines uh, are subscribed to those particular groups. And whenever a message needs to be sent through those groups, it will be identified by the IGMP protocol. And then that particular message will be sent to those multiple machines that are members of those particular groups. And then comes the broadcast. The third method is known as the broadcast. As it says, it is going to broadcast to all. So this is one to all. That is communication between a single user and it is going to be sent to all the machines in that particular network, right? So the three ways unicast is one to one, multicast is one to many, and broadcast is one to all. Then question number three, what is DNS? DNS stands for domain name system. It is like the internet's phone book that is responsible for mapping the domain name into its corresponding IP address. And let me give you an example over here. Whenever we go and open up, let's say a browser, a Google Chrome browser, we type in www.google.com and then we press enter and magically Google comes in front of us, the website rather. Now, how does the computer know who Google is? Because as far as we are concerned, humans understand Google and words like that. Computers don't. Computers de uh, deal with binary zeros and ones. Right. And as far as Internet is concerned, they will only deal with IP addresses and MAC addresses. So how does a computer know how to find Google.com and where is it located? So the moment we type in uh, uh, in the browser window in the address bar Google.com and press enter, a DNS query is generated automatically by the browser where a packet is sent to our DNS servers asking what the IP address is. So in short, DNS resolves domain names to their corresponding IP addresses. There is a DNS server which will have this index, a database of all the domains associated with their IP addresses. If one particular DNS server does not have that information that you're looking for, it may query another DNS server who may have that particular response. So the first thing is when you type in domain name, it gets resolved with the DNS. It identifies the IP address corresponding to that particular domain name and thus allows the computer to route that packet to the particular server where that domain name resides. So in this uh, scenario, if you look at the screen on the local PC, you have typed in cybersecurity.com. There's a DNS resolution that uh, a query that goes to the DNS server. What is the IP of cybersecurity.com? The DNS server looks it up in its particular uh, database if it has the corresponding IP address, it will then respond back the IP address is 172.17.252.1 after which the packet is sent off to cybersecurity.com. Moving on to the question number four, what is a firewall? 
Now, this is a very good question and normally a very basic answer that I've ever heard is that a firewall is a hardware and a software firewall. But that's the functionality of a firewall. That is what how you can install a firewall. But there are different types of firewalls and there is a specific functionality that a firewall is created for. Right. So a firewall is either a hardware or software, but its responsibility is for blocking either incoming or outgoing traffic from the internet to your computer. They secure a network. So essentially, the firewall will allow a connection to happen or disallow a connection to happen. It won't go beyond that. That's the basic functionality of a firewall. Okay. So based on the configurations that you have done, based on the rules that you have created on the firewall, it will then based on those rules, identify whether some traffic is allowed in that network or some traffic is to be blocked from entering that network. So as the screen shows, the firewall rules will analyze whether the traffic is good. If yes, it will allow. If the traffic is bad, it will block the traffic and not allow that connection from happening in the first place. Now, there are a few common types of firewalls that also need to be included in the answer to this question. And the first one is a packet filtering firewall. These are the most common types that you will come across, which analyze packets and lets them pass through only if they match an established security rule set. Now here people do get confused when we say that we analyze packets. People think that these firewalls will analyze the contents of that packet, which is not correct. When a definition for a packet filtering firewall says that these firewalls analyze packets, it means that they are only analyzing the source and destination IP addresses, port numbers, and the protocols that are mentioned in those packets. These firewalls do not have the cap capability of deep packet inspection or a DPI as it is known. If that capability comes into the picture, you're basically looking at an intrusion detection system or an intrusion prevention system in today's world called as a next gen firewall. Okay, so a packet filtering firewall essentially will only analyze data packets for its source and destination IP addresses, port numbers, and the protocol that is being utilized. It will then map that information to the rules that are there on the firewall. And based on those rules, it will either allow that connection to happen or disallow that connection from happening. The second type of is a proxy firewall. These firewalls filter network traffic at the application level. So when you say application level, they work at the layer seven of the OSI model. Packet filtering firewalls, since we have mentioned that they've worked on IP addressing and port numbers, will work on the network layer of the OSI model. Also on the transport layer, because you also look at protocols. Proxy firewalls will work at layer seven, which is the uh, application layer of the OSI model and will deal with application level protocols such as HTTP, HTTPS, FTP, SMTP, and so on and so forth. And the third one is a stateful multi-layer inspection firewall. Uh, these filter packets at the network, transport, and application layers. So they basically do the job of the first and the second type of firewalls. The packets are compared to known uh, trusted packets. But now the first question is, if there is a uh, stateful multi-layer inspection firewall, why do we have type one and type two firewalls, like packet filtering and proxy, proxy firewalls? That is because that is how the firewalls have evolved. We started off with the packet filtering, then we added functionality to it, and so on and so forth. So if a question comes, what is a firewall? You start off with the option saying it is a hardware or software. This is the responsibility, the functionality of a firewall is to allow good traffic and disallow bad traffic based on the rules that have been configured on the firewall. And then you've got basically three types of firewalls, packet filtering, proxy, and stateful multi-layer. And just include a brief description of each of these firewalls. If getting your learning started is half the battle, what if you could do that for free? Visit ScaleUp by Simply Learn. Click on the link in the description to know more. Then moving on to question number five, what is a VPN? VPN is also called a virtual private network. It is a connection between a VPN server and a VPN client. So it basically creates an encrypted tunnel between the client and the VPN server, which is then utilized to secure the connections that you're making with the internet. So as you can see in the diagram, the user has a VPN client installed on their machine. The VPN client then creates an encrypted tunnel to the VPN server. And through this tunnel, encrypted data is transmitted, which can then be uh, processed by the VPN server, uh, sent to the internet. Information can, receive, be, can be received back by the VPN server. The VPN server will encrypt that data back and send it back to the user. 
So if there is a man in the middle attack that is happening or a hacker trying to eavesdrop on the communication mechanism, they will not be able to do so because of the encrypted tunnel. It is very difficult to decrypt this or hack through this encrypted tunnel. It, the, it is possible, but it is very difficult to achieve that. Moving on to question number six, what are the advantages of distributed processing? Now, before we go into advantages of distributed processing, we first have to understand what is distributed processing. So it is a term which describes various computer systems that use more than one processor to run an application. Here, multiple computers across different locations share the same processor. The advantages of distributing processes are as follows. But before we go into the advantages, distributed computing is basically where multiple machines will pool their resources together to run a singular application. So an application that has multiple resources and can scale up and scale down as and when required. The advantages are that it can be very, uh, very useful in data recovery. For example, RAID, where you're striping data on uh, various hard disks. It is reliable. It is cheaper. Lower cost can be achieved. And it is easy to expand because of the scalability factor that we just talked about. If there is loss of data in one computer, it can then be recovered by another interconnected computer. And one of the examples would be blockchain in today's world, right? What is blockchain? That this data is uh, created live and stored on a connection of computers. So if one of the computers goes offline, the other computers in that network will still have that data and they, the blockchain will still function without any issues. The second point, a glitch in one machine does not affect the processing as there will be multiple other machines like we discussed in the blockchain. Several cost effective mini computers are used instead of costly or mainframe machines. So instead of having a server bank, I can have multiple machines connect interconnected together and they can function in that particular blockchain or for that particular distributed processing mechanism. Depending on the amount of data processing, more computers can be attached to the network. Thus, you can increase the number of computers that can be a part of that blockchain or you can reduce them as and when necessary. Moving on to question number seven. What is TCP IP? TCP IP or Transmission Control Protocol over Internet Protocol is a set of communication protocols that are used to interconnect networking devices on the Internet. This protocol defines how data should be transmitted over the Internet by providing end-to-end -end communications. So essentially, if you want networking to be established on your machine, you will need TCP IP. Without TCP IP, there will be no work groups, there will be no domains. Basically, your interconnectivity will go for a toss. TCP IP is a software that once installed on your machine will then interact with the hardware, which is your network interface cards, and then your switches, wires, cables, and all those through protocols that have been already pre-configured in it. So within the TCP IP suite of softwares, you will have all the protocols, all the functionality of the OSI layer, and each and every protocol that works on each and every layer will be predefined and pre-configured to work in a particular manner. The internet protocol is all about routing each individual packet to make sure it reaches its destination. So with the TCP, you're talking about the protocols that will allow you to format the data and generate it so that you can communicate it over the network. The IP will then deal with the routing of those packets so that the packet can be routed to the correct computer and be received by the recipient. So the TCP IP model is the compressed version of the OSI model. The seven layers uh, will get converted into four layers, the network access layer, internet layer, transport layer, and application layer. Going on to question eight, what do you mean by IP config and IF config? Both of these are commands, the first one on a Windows machine, the second one on a Linux machine. So IP config is known as the Internet Protocol Configuration. This is a command that is used on the command line interface of Microsoft Windows to view all the adapters and the configuration of each and every adapters for their network interfaces. So as you can see on the right hand side in the command prompt screen, if uh, once you type in the IP config command on the C prompt and press enter, it will give you a list of all the adapters that are there. So you can see wireless LAN adapter local area connection, the media is disconnected, it doesn't exist. At the bottom, you'll see the Wi-Fi connection, wireless LAN adapter, and it can give you the IP version 6 IP address, IP version 4 address, the subnet mask and the default gateway. So this is the configuration that allows the machine to know on what network it is on, what is the default gateway for communicating to the internet, 
what is the subnet mask so how many computers may exist in that particular network and what is the ip address of that specific computer so that it can communicate across the network as well if config is the same thing on a linux mac or unix operating system so the command will also give you the list of interfaces and the configuration of each and every interface it is used to configure control the tcp ip network interface parameters from the command line interface it allows you to see the ip address of these network interfaces so here you can see uh, the wlp 19s the ip address being 192.168.43.215 subnet mask being 255.255.255.0 with the broadcast being 192.168.43.255 question 9 what is the difference between a domain and a workgroup? This can be a very interesting question and can be a very lengthy question at the same time. A workgroup is nothing but a decentralized network where you have interconnected multiple machines together and each machine acts in its own individual capacity. Things of itself as a server, right? So a decentralized network, you, every user manages the resources individually on their PC. So local users on their own PCs managing uh, the network shares what can be shared from that particular machine what data should be shared should not be shared to whom it can be shared with and so on and so forth it is good if you've got a small network uh, a few machines all together uh, and you want them to interact with minimal management effort right so each computer each user will decide what they want to allow other users to see on that particular network mm -hmm. and all of them would be connected over a lan a local area network either a wireless or a wired one so if you look at your home Wi-Fi right now, that is one of the best examples of having a work group. The domain on the other hand is a centralized network model. So in a corporate environment, whenever you go there and you got a domain based username and password, which when entered onto a particular machine gives you access to the entire network or whatever applications and whatever resources have been allocated to you, that is where the domain comes in. So it, it also uses a single sign on mechanism for all the resources that are made, that are to be made available to you. Whereas in a work group, your local user only meant for that particular computer, right? So coming back to the domain, it is an administrator who's going to manage the entire domain and all of the resources connected to the domain. The resources could be switches, routers, servers, data stores, applications, web servers, mail exchange servers, and so on and so forth. So all of these are administered by an administrator through the domain. It is the most reliable and the optimum solution for a large network where multiple users are going to interconnect and share that data amongst each other, right? The computer can be connected to any network. That means you can be on the internet and through the internet using a VPN, you can connect to your corporate network, authenticate in and get access to whatever resources you are allowed to access. Whereas in a work group, you have to be a part of that network to access that particular network. If you change your location, you go and connect to another Wi-Fi, you will lose access to your previous Wi-Fi. Then the last question for the networking uh, section, what is data encapsulation in networking? Data encapsulation refers to the process of adding headers and trailers to the data. The data link layer binds each packet into a frame that contains the hardware address of the source and the destination computer. So in this example, when you're talking about data encapsulation, we have talked about how data that has been created by the application layer would have a header and a trailer that will give the various informations of where that data needs to be sent. So the hardware address, which is the MAC address comes into the picture and gets added to the header and the IP addresses, port numbers and all of those things would then be added to this uh, trailers as well so that the data can be then routed to the intended recipient of that particular communication. So with this, we have come to the end of this session on the networking full course. I hope this session was informative and interesting. If you have any queries regarding any of the topics covered in this session, or if you require the resources like PPT, code documents, or anything, then please let us know in the comment section below. And our team of experts will be happier to resolve all your queries at the earliest. Until next time, thank you, stay safe, and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.